two, three, and testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing, testing. Ladies and gentlemen, okay, okay, you were not here for me, okay. So just uh, a couple um, housekeeping rules, or so we see that there's a lot of people here. Um, so if you were to scooch to the center of the seat, so you leave some open for the edges, so someone doesn't have to awkwardly, uh, you know, slide in. Um, also, just so you know, this event is being live streamed, so if you're wondering what the cameras were for, um, now you know. And let's see, um, if you want a quick rundown, it's going to be roughly about a 90-minute talk with uh, some Q&A afterwards. Um, and yeah, in case you didn't know, Timothy Clarkson, uh, I am leader at Rashio Christie. Um, and also, I had a whole bio for Frank Turek, but, you know, you're not really here for a bio, you're here for Dr. Frank, so please give it up for Dr. Frank Turek. Good evening, Wildcats. Let's go back to September 29, 2006. That's when Petty Officer Michael Monsor is a United States Navy SEAL operating in Ramadi, Iraq. Are we going to have feedback issues? Maybe. Um, we'll turn it down a little bit. I can turn it off because you can probably. Oh, the mic up there needs to be turned off. Okay, we got it. Anyway, Monsor is uh, in Ramadi, Iraq, and he's standing on a roof in Ramadi. And he's standing in front of a doorway to this roof. He's got two Navy SEAL teammates lying in the sniper-prone position at his feet. They've already taken AK-47 fire and a rocket-propelled grenade. Clint, Clint, too much feedback. I don't know. If I stand up here, then I'm going to be in the light, so maybe we can turn it down right here. Or I could just be loud because I am loud. All right, all right, stand by. We're right in the middle of the Michael Monsor story, and we're having feedback issues. Stand by. We're getting it. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Can you hear? Can you guys hear? Is that, is that better than all the echoey? Okay. Anyway, Monsor is standing on a roof in Ramadi, and he's got two Navy SEAL teammates lying in the sniper-prone position at his feet. They've already taken AK-47 fire and a rocket-propelled grenade, but they're not exactly sure where the enemy is. There's a bit of a lull, lull in the fighting. Insurgents have blocked off the streets in Ramadi, and there's someone on the loudspeaker in the town mosque yelling, kill the Americans. As Monsor and his team are looking for the next attack, an insurgent from an unknown location throws a grenade up on the roof. It hits Monsor in the chest, and it falls to his feet. Due to the length of the throw, there's no opportunity to pick it up and throw it back. He has only a split second to make a decision. 
He can leap through the doorway behind him and save himself, but if he does, his two teammates lying at his feet will surely die. Mansoor yells, Grenade! But instead of jumping backward to save himself, he jumps forward chest first onto the grenade. It detonates. 30 minutes later, 25-year-old Michael Monsor is dead. His two teammates lying at his feet receive only minor injuries because Monsor's body muffled the blast. One of the survivors said at Monsor's funeral, Mikey looked death in the face that day and said, you will not take my friends, I will go in their stead. I've never seen a United States president cry until April of 2008. That's when President George W. Bush invited Monsoor's parents into the East Room of the White House to give them their son's Medal of Honor posthumously. The president couldn't even get through the citation without breaking down. Since then, Monsoor's High School in Garden Grove, California built a new stadium. They named it Michael A. Monsoor Memorial Stadium. The golden trident insignia that the seals wear dominates the 50-yard line. January 2019, North Island, California, just outside of San Diego, the United States Navy commissioned the USS Michael Monsoor, the newest guided missile destroyer in the fleet, Zumwalt class. I was just in San Diego last summer, and this ship is sitting right there in the bay. This is Monsoor's mother, Sally, being escorted onto the ship, named in honor of her fallen son. Now, why did they do this? Because Michael Monsoor literally sacrificed himself to save his friends. There's no greater love than to sacrifice yourself to save your friends, said Jesus of Nazareth before he went to the cross. Michael Monsoor sacrificed himself to save his friends. The question is, would anyone sacrifice himself to save you? And the answer is, someone already has. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. But of course, in today's culture, a lot of people don't think the story's true. They think it's invented. After all, it was written down by religious people. They tend to embellish things. And it's got miracles in it, like a resurrection. How many people in this room have ever seen someone rise from the dead after you knew they were dead for at least 36 hours? Yeah, crickets. Why? Because it doesn't happen. And for you to be a Christian, you have to believe something none of us have ever seen. How rational is that? Well, I actually think it's quite easy to show that Christianity is true. You only need to answer four questions in the affirmative. In other words, if you investigate these four questions, I think you'll realize that the answer to these four questions is yes, and if the answer to these four questions is yes, then Christianity is true. What are the four questions? Here are the four questions. Now that is some pretty grooving music, isn't it? Yeah, that's actually from our TV show on Wednesday nights. Uh, tonight, 9 p.m., I gotta get to it. Uh, it's on DirecTV channel 378. If you don't have DirecTV, anyone have Roku? You guys have Roku in here? Okay, look for NRB TV, National Religious Broadcasters, on Roku and you'll find it. If you don't have DirecTV and you don't have Roku, it's on this new technology sweeping Durham, New Hampshire right now. It's called the internet. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah, it's on our website, crossexamine.org, at that time. We're also on radio every Saturday mornings, but if you're a college student, I know you don't get up until the crack of noon on Saturday, so you're not going to listen to it then, but it is podcasted. It's called the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast. Actually, it, comes, it goes on our podcast Friday night and also Tuesday night. There's two a week, and what we do is we present evidence for Christianity, and we cross-examine ideas against it. Now, why are these the four questions? Truth, God, miracles, and the New Testament. And this is going to serve as our outline here tonight. First question, does truth exist? Why is that important? Because you hear people saying there's no truth. You got your truth. I got my truth. All truth is relative. Look, if there's no truth, Christianity can't be true. Of course, if there's no truth, atheism can't be true either. 
right? I mean, look, if there was no truth, why would you even come to the University of New Hampshire? Aren't you here to learn truth? Isn't that the whole point, right? Would you ever read a book if there was no truth? Could you ever catch someone in a lie if there was no truth? No, lies presuppose truth, don't they? So we're going to spend a little bit of time on point one. Second point, does God exist? Or second question. Tonight I hope to show you through three arguments that God really does exist. These arguments are actually in the Bible, but you don't need the Bible to know them. In fact, you can establish that God exists without any reference to any religious work. You can just look around and know that God exists. Third question, are miracles possible? Christianity can't be true if miracles are not possible, and most of us have never seen a miracle, so why would we believe they occur? Well, I hope to show you tonight that not only are miracles possible, but the greatest miracle in the Bible has already occurred, and even atheists are admitting the evidence for this miracle. We'll see that tonight. Then we're going to get to the key question, is the New Testament true when it comes to one particular event from the ancient world? The one event that makes Christianity true, if true, and false, if not true. What event is that? Anyone know? The resurrection. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, game over, Christianity's true. Of course, if he didn't rise from the dead, game over, it's false. You might as well sleep in on Sunday and do what you want the rest of the week. Because if Christianity isn't true, and you're a Christian, your faith is in vain. Paul said you ought to just give it up. That's what he said to the church at Corinth. His first letter, chapter 15. Do you realize that Christianity is a worldview you can investigate and try and discover whether or not it's true? It's not just someone's philosophy. You've got to take someone's word for it. This is how to live. No, you can see if this really did occur. And that's what we're going to try and do here tonight. Now, if I time this, we're going to go through these four questions. And if I time this just right, we'll have absolutely no time for your questions. No, no, no. We're going to have time for questions later. Um, but we're going to start right here at point one, does truth exist? Are you guys ready to go? Are you ready to go? Come on. Yeah. All right, Wildcats, here we go. Whenever you start talking about truth, you always have to start with Jack Nicholson. Right? Because Tom Cruise had him on the witness stand, and he said to him, Colonel, I want the truth. And Nicholson said, Wildcats, that was lame. <laughs> if he said it that way, the movie would have gone nowhere. You can't handle That's not how he said it. Here's how he said it. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. All right, let's try it again. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Now, that felt better, didn't it? Didn't you ever want to do that with a professor up here? You can't handle the truth. Well, there's a lot of people that can't handle the truth. They're saying, you got your truth. I got my truth. All truth is relative. Well, ladies and gentlemen, to show you what a dimwit I was, I was 33 years old, I already had a master's degree, and I did not know what I'm about to show you now. And I think this is the most important thinking skill I ever learned. I had to learn it in seminary. You know why? Because I never took a course in logic. Who here has taken a course in logic? Can I see your hands, please? See these people with their hands up? Here are the homeschoolers, right here. <laughs> right here, homeschoolers, okay? If we taught logic in public school, things would be a lot better. We wouldn't be, we'd be telling people how to think, not what to feel. That's what we tend to do now. We tell people what to feel. And this thinking skill we're about to unveil here is based on the law of non-contradiction, one of the fundamental laws of all logic, which says opposite ideas cannot both be true at the same time and in the same sense. For example, we can't both be in New Hampshire and not in New Hampshire at the same time and in the same sense. Or God can't both exist and not exist at the same time and in the same sense. It's one or the other. Now, this little thinking skill will help save you from a lot of pain and suffering. Why? Because this thinking skill will help you discover what is false. And half the battle in life is discovering what is false. Why? Because you want to avoid what's false and you want to concentrate on what's tr true. If you start living by false principles, ultimately you're going to smack up against reality and it's going to hurt. Yeah, you can deny reality exists, but you can't avoid the consequences of living against reality. So the thinking skill, probably the easiest way of me of showing you the thinking skill is to give you an example of using it. Suppose someone were to say to you, there is no truth. You should ask that person a question, what should the question be? Is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true, but it claims to be true. Did I say that right? Can everyone see this is a self-defeating statement? It's like saying I can't speak a word in English. If I were to say that, what would you say? Yeah, you just used English to say it. And this thinking skill asks you to do this. Turn the claim on itself. 
turn the claim on itself. So if somebody says there's no truth, you turn the claim on itself and you ask, is that? And you don't have to be unkind to do this. You're not making statements. You're asking questions, right? You can amaze your friends. If they say there's no truth, you say, is that true? They'll freeze. They won't know what to do because they don't realize that they're defeating themselves. Let's do a few more of these. Suppose someone were to say to you, there's no such thing as absolute truth. If you turn the claim on itself, what question are you going to ask back? Yeah, is that an absolute truth? Or you might want to say, are you absolutely sure? Can everyone see that this is an absolute truth claiming there are no such thing as absolute truths? It would be like me saying my parents had no kids that lived, right? It defeats itself. Now, actually, in our culture today, it's not said this way. It's more often said this way, or at least related this way. There isn't, oh, I forgot about this one. All truth is relative. You probably heard that. Somebody says that. What do you say to them? Turn the claim on itself. Yeah, is that relative? Is that a relative truth? No, that's an absolute truth claim. Again, claiming all truth is relative. It's self-defeating. But here's what I wanted to say. This is the way people say it today. There isn't the truth, only my truth. You know, you've got your truth, I've got my truth, you live your truth, I'll live my truth, we'll all get along. It sounds so right, doesn't it? It sounds like we all ought to believe this. It sounds so Oprah. It sounds so common sense. There's just one big problem with it. It's self-defeating. If you turn the claim on itself after somebody says there isn't the truth, only my truth, you'll simply ask them, is that just your truth or the truth? In other words, is this statement right here your truth? If it is, if it's just your opinion, that's fine. Just your opinion. But if you're saying it's not just your opinion, if you're saying this statement up here is the truth, well, the first half of it says there are no the truths. Can everyone see this is a the truth statement claiming there are no such things as the truth statements? This is self-defeating. I know it's very unpopular in our culture to say, but there's no such thing as your truth. There's no such thing as my truth. There's just the truth. If you're going to say you've got your own math or your own truth, you might as well say I've got my own math, right? I mean, imagine if Kevin back here, who uh, helped uh, or, uh, organize this thing, said to me, hey, Frank, right after this event, I want you to hang around. Come back tomorrow because we've got to clean up some things here around the university. I'll pay you $10 an hour. You just tell me how many hours you work. Now, actually, Kevin would never do this. He doesn't pay that much. Anyway, <laughs> but let's suppose I did hang around, and I worked all day yesterday. I worked for 15 hours, and I go to him, Kevin, I'm done. He goes, okay, what do I owe you? I say, okay, $10 an hour times $15 an hour. You owe me $150,000. He goes, $150,000? I go, $150,000. What are you talking about? And I say, oh, no, you don't understand. I have my own math, right? What's he going to say? He's going to say, you're crazy. There's not my math or your math. There's just math. There's not my truth or your truth. There's just truth. And it's self-defeating to say otherwise. Now, actually, sometimes it's said this way. It's true for you, but not for me. Oh, Christianity may be true for you, but Buddhism's true for me. Well, what do you say to that? Again, this is self-defeating. If you turn the claim on itself, it's just a little bit more subtle than many of these other claims. If somebody says it's true for you but not for me, you might want to ask them, is that true for everybody? Is true for you but not for me true for everybody? Because if true for you but not for me is true for everybody, then true for you but not for me can't be true because it's true for everybody. Did I say that right? I know this can give you intellectual constipation if you think about it long enough. But that's because it's like saying I can't speak a word in English. Actually, there's a more fun way of dealing with this. If somebody says it's true for you but not for me, try that with the state police next time you get pulled over. <laughs> right? Suppose you're going down Highway 93. You're going 100. New Hampshire cop sees you, pulls you over, walks up to the car, knocks on the glass. You put the window down. He says, you're going 100. It's easy to get out of a ticket. You simply say, ha, that's true for you but not for me. And you speed away. <laughs> you can't give a ticket if it's not true for you. No, if it's true you were going 100, that's true for all people at all times in all places when referring to you at that time. It's just true. I go to a lot of churches, by the way. I normally ask people, do you think Christianity is true? And most people will say yes, and then I'll ask them why. Why do you think it's true? You know what answer I get more than any other? Because I have faith. Is that a good answer? Does your faith, your psychological state, change what's true out here? Does your faith change whether or not God exists or Jesus rose from the dead? No, your faith doesn't change a thing about those things. I mean, do you have to believe something to make it true? Do you have to believe in gravity to stay on the ground? Do people who don't believe in gravity float away? 
Hey, look, there's another one. Hey, if you believe, you'll come back. No, that's not the way it works. You say, well, why is the Bible always talking about faith then? Because there's two kinds of faith. This is a very important distinction. There's belief that, and then there's belief in. Belief that is getting evidence that God exists, that Jesus rose from the dead, that the documents of the New Testament are telling us the truth. That's what we call apologetics. It doesn't mean we're saying we're sorry. It means we're giving evidence for our position. But all the belief that in the world won't get your moral transgressions forgiven. For that, you've got to go from belief that to belief in. There's a difference. Do you know, in fact, James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote that little book in the New Testament called Wildcats, you are sharp tonight. James says even the demons believe that God exists, but they tremble. Do you know that if God exists, and he does, and if demons exist, and they do, that they know that God exists better than we do? But they don't trust in him. Why? They don't want to trust in him. Because there's a difference between just knowing something's true and assenting to it. In fact, we know this in relationships, don't we? You can know somebody be a great spouse and still not ask them to marry you, right? In fact, when I met my wife 38 years ago, I got evidence that she would be a good wife, but all the evidence in the world didn't make her my wife. I had to take a step of trust in her to ask her to be my wife. And in a momentary lapse of judgment, she said yes. <laughs> That's the difference between belief that and belief in. One is of the head, the other's not only of the head, but of the heart. And most of the time, when the Bible's talking about faith, it's talking about the second kind. It's talking about belief in. After you know that Jesus is the Savior, trust in him. In fact, John, who wrote the biography we call the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, last verse, I'm paraphrasing, he says, these things were written down so that you may know that Jesus is the Savior, and by believing in him, you may have life in his name. You see the difference between belief that and belief in? Faith is not blind. I know the title of the book. I'm, we're just trading on the common definition of faith. But in reality, faith is not blind. Faith does not mean you have no evidence. Faith means you're trusting in what you have good evidence to believe that is true. You're trusting in what you have good evidence to believe that is true. Now, in our culture too, you're gonna hear this a lot. I know you've got some good science uh, programs here, but sometimes you'll hear there's no truth in anything but science. If you turn the claim on itself, by the way, this is called scientism, that you get all your truth from science. If you turn the claim on itself, what question are you gonna ask back? Yeah, is that a scientific truth? Can you go in the laboratory and prove this claim? No, that's a philosophical claim. You can't prove that in the laboratory. This is not a statement of science, that's a statement about science. And you can't do science without philosophy. How many graduate students do we have here? Anyone here going for a PhD? When you're going for a PhD, what does the PhD stand? It doesn't stand for phenomenally dumb. It stands for philosophy of whatever. Philosophy of physics, philosophy of biology, philosophy of history, whatever it is. Philosophy undergirds everything you do. How am I defining philosophy here? Right thinking about reality. You can't understand the Bible without philosophy, much less experiments or anything else you do. In fact, in the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist book, we have this little section in there on science, and here's the title of the section. Science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. Now, why do I say that? Because all data needs to be gathered, and all data needs to be interpreted, and who does that? Scientists do that, right? Look, if scientists get good data and they interpret it properly, you'll get good advice, right? In fact, well, think about it this way. COVID, how many different pieces of advice have we had on COVID, right? You say, well, follow the science. What science? Who's interpreting? Because if they get good data and they interpret it properly, you get good advice. If they get good data, don't interpret it properly, you're gonna get bad advice. If they got bad data, it doesn't matter how they interpret it, you're gonna get bad advice. If there's a political agenda, oh, that'll never happen. Why do we think that scientists are immune to the same three temptations the rest of us are not immune to? What are any one of these three things? These three things can destroy your life almost immediately if used improperly. What are they? Does anyone know? Sex, money, and power. They can cause people to do crazy stuff. And the reason is because those are good things. In fact, they're so good, we'll take shortcuts to get them. And I think when you look back at what's happened lately, you realize there was a lot of power and a lot of money that came into some of these decisions that were made. And I still don't know what to believe about COVID, do you? 
One guy's got it right. It's hard to know because it got politicized. That's why. Now, obviously, if science done well, it makes our life wonderful. But science not done well can be very dangerous. In fact, you can't put morality in a test tube. You can use science like Joseph Mengele used science, right? To torture people. Or you can use science like a good doctor does to try and heal people. Science is amoral. You have to bring morality to it. And it's as, as, as important as science is, though, it's not the most important thing in the world, right? I mean, think about it. Honey, do you love me? Yeah, why? I don't know. Let's run an experiment. No, okay. Or how about this? You're going to hear this a lot. You ought not judge, especially if you're a Christian. Jesus said, don't judge. Why are you judging, you hypocrites? All right, put Jesus aside for just a second. What's the problem with this claim logically? Yeah, if somebody says you ought not judge, you might want to ask, hey, isn't that a judgment? Or you might want to say, if we're not to judge, why are you judging me for judging? You say, wait a minute, Frank, time out. Didn't Jesus say don't judge? Nope, never said it. Sure he did. He said it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. His most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. He said, judge not. All right, I know this is going to sound weird for you Christians in here, but stick with me. It's true. There are no verses in the Bible. There are no verses in the Bible. Do you think when Matthew is writing his biography of who Jesus was, that he said, here's chapter 7, verse 1? No. When were the chapter and verse divisions put in? Yeah, there were some early on, and then the kind of versions we have now with the chapters and verse divisions about 500 years ago to help us navigate the text, which is really important. Why? It'd be really hard to find your way around this big series of books put together if you didn't have numbers. I mean, imagine if you went to church one Sunday, the pastor got up there, opened his Bible, he didn't have numbers, you didn't have numbers in yours, and he simply looked at you and he said, Let's go about two-thirds of the way in. Let's see if we can find the same spot. No, you wouldn't be able to do that, right? You need numbers to find your way around. The problem is we tend to think if it's got a number in front of it, we can make it say whatever we want. You can't do that. You need to figure out the context. What else is going on there? By the way, well, some of you are going to hate me for this, but I have a 6 a.m. flight tomorrow, so I don't care. Okay? This is why you should never say that Jeremiah 29, 11, if you're a Christian, is a promise to you. You know Jeremiah 29, 11. Oh, the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you hope in the future. This is on coffee mugs. This is on pillows. This is on birthday cards. This is everywhere, and it has nothing to do with 21st century Christianity. This is not a promise to 21st century Christians. Who is that a promise to? This is a promise to the exiles in 586 B.C. that were taken to Iraq by Nebuchadnezzar and God through the prophet Jeremiah saying, hey, 70 years from now, don't worry about it. I'm going to prosper you, bring you back to the land. It has nothing to do with 21st century Christians. It's not a promise to us. I always ask people who quote that as if it's a promise to them. Why don't you quote Jeremiah 4411 if it's, uh, as if it's a promise to you? What's in Jeremiah 4411? In Jeremiah 4411, this is what God said he would do to the exiles that went to Egypt, and he warned them, don't go to Egypt. You know what Jeremiah 44, 11 says? It says, I will destroy you and all Judah. You don't see that stitched into a pillow. You don't see that on a coffee mug. You don't see that on a birthday card, happy birthday. I will destroy you and all Judah. That is so sweet, Grandma. Thank you so much. Right? No. We're taking stuff out of context, and we're doing the same thing here in Matthew 7, 1. Jesus doesn't say, judge not, and he stops right there. What does he say? Judge not, lest you be judged by the same standard you judge others. You be judged by that standard. So before you try and take the speck out of your brother's eye, you hypocrite, which is a judgment, notice that, take the log out of your own eye first, then you'll be able to help your brother. And then he goes on to say, don't cast your pearls before swine, which is what? Another judgment. Is Jesus telling us not to judge here? No, he's telling us to take the speck out of our brother's eye. That involves making a judgment. He's simply saying, get that problem out of your life first so you can better help your brother. So this is not a command not to judge. It's actually a command on how to judge. In other words, don't judge hypocritically. If you've got that problem, fix it, then go help your brother. But it would be completely ridiculous to say don't make judgments. Why? Number one, it's a judgment itself. Number two, you'd be dead already if you didn't make judgments. You made 100 judgments tonight just getting over here. And now you're going, this was a bad judgment. I shouldn't be here. This guy is crazy, all right? In fact, Jesus elsewhere says, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. You have to make a judgment to be a Christian or not to be a Christian or to be an atheist. 
By the way, atheists make judgments. They judge there's no God. The Bible's not telling the truth. There's no objective meaning to life. These are all judgments. The question isn't whether or not you can make judgments. The question is, are your judgments true? I will say this, though. Jesus did save a very stern rebuke for people who were judgmental. And who were the judgmental ones in his day? Anyone? Pharisees. And who were the Pharisees? What was their job in ancient Israel? What did they do? They were the teachers of the law, religious leaders, and they were the politicians. Why? Because some of them were on the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, to whom Rome delegated day-to-day lawmaking authority. They were the politicians, and Jesus went after these people. Are you telling me Jesus got involved in politics? Yes! And he wasn't so nice doing it. In fact, if you think Jesus was a sweet guy who's never said a bad word about anyone, you have not read John chapter 2, John chapter 8, or Matthew chapter 23. What happens in John chapter 2? Jesus makes a whip, and he goes, and he jacks people up in the temple. Sweet and gentle Jesus did this? Yes! And then in John chapter 8, he's arguing with these politicians, these Pharisees, and he's right in the middle of the argument when he says, your father is the devil. Jesus, you can't say that. That's not very Christ-like. Hey, excuse me, I am Christ? Can you imagine you're having an argument with somebody and you stop right in the middle and you go, your father is the devil. Never try that with a sibling, by the way. And then in Matthew 23, Jesus really goes off on these Pharisees. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Oh, you look great on the outside. You're whitewashed tombs, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You go a mile to make a convert, and then once you make them a convert, you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. How will you avoid being condemned to hell? What? Sweet and gentle Jesus said this? Yes, Jesus was not Barney. Can't we all get along, boys and girls? No! I came to bring a sword. It's going to divide mother and daughter, father and son. How many many have ever heard a sermon on those passages? But if you're a Christian, you know those verses are true. Why? Because you're probably at odds with people in your own family because of Jesus. By the way, Jesus was tough. He wasn't a sissy. Why did they kill him? Number one, he claimed to be God. That was blasphemy to the Jews and sedition to the Romans. And number two, he spoke truth to power, particularly Caiaphas, who was the high priest who knew that if Jesus succeeded, he was out of a job. In fact, I think Caiaphas knew Jesus was the Messiah because right after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, what does Caiaphas, the high priest, say? It's better that one innocent man die than the whole nation perish. Caiaphas didn't want to lose his sex, money, power, did not want to lose his job. And so he killed Jesus. He had Jesus killed. By the way, I've noticed one other thing about judging. You ever notice when you compliment somebody, which is a judgment, nobody gets upset? You know, if, I, if you say to your best friend, I really love you, you're such a wonderful person, I wish you could be like you, you think your friend's going to say, well, who are you to judge? No, they're never going to say that. Why? Because I've noticed that people don't have a problem with judging. They just have a problem with judgments they don't like. In fact, if you tell somebody something that's true and they get upset with you, you just help convict them. As Augustine said, we love the truth when it enlightens us. We hate the truth when it convicts us. A few military people in here, and by the way, I was in the Navy for eight years, which stands for never again volunteer yourself. A few military people in here, you always get more flack when you're over the target. If you tell somebody something that's true and they're shooting back at you, you're over the target. They don't want their evil deeds exposed. Men love darkness rather than light, said Jesus. So we have to tell people the truth, but we have to do it without being judgmental. In fact, none of us are going to get to God because we're better than anyone else. We're only going to get to God through Jesus. We're all fallen. We all need a Savior. In fact, somebody said, evangelism is just one beggar showing another beggar where the food is. Now, there's many more of these self-defeating statements. We don't have time. Let's sum it up all this way. Can everybody see that this statement right here shoots itself? Can everybody see that? 
And all the other statements we went through, they all shoot themselves as well because they violate the law of non-contradiction. They're false. You know what this means? Relativism and postmodernism are false because they claim it's true that there is no truth. Yet, tragically, most of our universities and many of our high schools buy into postmodernism. Have you encountered that here at UNH? Isn't it amazing? You could spend 20, 30, 40, 50 grand a year to have some guy tell you the truth that there is no truth. Why? The most important thing any of us can learn is logic because it's going to save you a lot of pain and suffering if you know how to see through some of these logically self-defeating ideas. You can't get away from truth. Well, actually, you can get away from it for a while. For a while, you can suppress it. In fact, as you know, we go to a lot of colleges and do this. This is actually a picture from the event we had at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And they love the Bible there about as much as the University of California at Berserkley does. And I always set up, we always set up a microphone. We'll have the microphone set up. And I, um, I may ask you a question. And it's not fair for me to do that if you ask me a question without me warning you what the question is. So here's a question I might ask you. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, thank you for being here, but I'm giving you a heads up of a question I might ask you so you can think about it, okay? Here's the question I might ask you. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? I've had atheists stand at that microphone in front of hundreds of people and say, no! No. I thought you claimed to be reasonable. How is it reasonable that you wouldn't believe something that were true or that was true? Well, it's not a matter of reason. It's not a matter of the head. It's a matter of the heart. They may not want it to be true. They don't want there to be a God. Why? They want to be God of their own lives. And half the time I do too, don't you? You don't want to answer to anybody else. Often we're not on a truth quest. We're on a happiness quest. And we're just going to believe whatever we think is going to make us happy. That's what we're after. Here's the problem. You can make yourself happy over the short term doing a lot of fun, selfish, yet sinful things. However, over the long term, it's a disaster. And the few people in here over 40 know what I'm talking about because many of us have tried it ourselves. If you want to get contentment, you've got to go straight through truth, and Jesus is the truth. So always ask the question, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Or if you don't like the term Christianity, if Jesus really rose from the dead to prove he was God, would you follow him? If the answer is no, it's not a matter of the head. It's a matter of the heart. By the way, fair question for an atheist to ask. If atheism were true, would you be an atheist? Fair question for a Muslim to ask. If Islam were true, would you be a Muslim, right? Don't we want to follow truth? Hopefully. All right, so we know that at least truth exists. The next question, is it true that God exists? And I mentioned three arguments we're going to go through. Let's take a look at the three. The first argument is the argument from the beginning of the universe known as the cosmological argument. Now, cosmological comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means world or universe. And it says if the universe had a beginning, it must have had a beginner. The second argument is the argument from design, also known as the teleological argument. And telos is a Greek word meaning design or purpose. And it says if there's design in the universe and design in you, life, there must be a designer. Now, these two arguments have some scientific evidence behind them. We'll see it here in just a minute. The third argument doesn't have any science behind it. It's more philosophical in nature, yet it's the argument we've all known since we were very small children. It's the argument from morality known as the moral argument. And it says if there's one thing morally wrong out there, just one, like it's wrong to torture babies for fun, or it's wrong to murder six million people in a holocaust, or it's wrong to walk into a school and shoot nine-year-olds like what happened just a few weeks ago, then there has to be a God. Why? Because if there is no standard beyond humanity that we're obligated to obey, then everything's just a matter of opinion. That's just your opinion against a baby torturer's opinion. That's just your opinion against Hitler's opinion. That's just your opinion against some school shooter's opinion. Well, we know those issues aren't just a matter of opinion. If they're not just a matter of opinion, there must be an external standard, a moral standard that we're obligated to obey. That's what we mean by God. Now, we'll get to that argument later, but we've got to start here at the cosmological argument. Now, you've got to admit, it was worth coming here tonight just to see God do that. <laughs> now, some of you said, I've never seen God move. Oh, really? Check this out. 
Look at that. Now, this is the argument that many say points back to the big. Now, some of you are going, uh, Frank, you know, we're Christians in here. Uh, we don't believe in the Big Bang. You guys don't believe in the Big Bang? I believe in the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. In fact, the evidence for the Big Bang is so good that even atheistic scientists are admitting it. And Stephen Hawking, who was probably the top physicist in the world until he died about five years ago, put it this way. Almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Hawking's an atheist. He tried to come up with another explanation other than God for the beginning. He failed, but he's admitting the data that space, time, and matter literally came into existence out of nothing. Now, we're not going to go through the evidence for this here tonight. Why? Number one, we don't have time. Number two, it's all in the book, chapter three. Number three, it's not controversial. Even atheists are admitting it. It's not controversial that the universe had a beginning. What is controversial is what caused it. That's what I want to talk about. But before I do, I just want to give you one piece of philosophical evidence the universe had a beginning, regardless of what the science says. Let's take a look at a timeline here for just a second. See this timeline right here? Let's say this is today right here. There's yesterday, there's the day before yesterday, there's last week. And let's say we don't know how far back this timeline goes. Here's my question. Can this timeline be infinite into the past? No, why not? You guys are sounding like Charlie Brown's teacher right now. Like, <laughs> It can't be infinite into the past because if there were an infinite number of days before today, today never would have gotten here. Because you'd always have to live another day before you got to today if there's an infinite number of days, right? So there can only be a finite number of days before today, which means what? That time had a beginning. And if time had a beginning, what could have caused time? Only something outside of time. And if you're outside of time, if you're timeless, do you have a beginning? No, that's the whole point. This answers the question, who made God? God is timeless. He's outside of time. He's the unmade maker. He's the uncreated creator. Well, let's get to that. Is he really? Well, the bottom line is this. If the past were infinite, today never would have arrived, okay? This is called the Kalam cosmological arguments. But since today is here, there must only be a finite number of days before today. Now, if the universe had a beginning, it must have had a beginner. We've got two options. Either no one created something out of nothing, which is the atheistic view, or someone created something out of nothing, which is the theistic view. Now, here's my only question. Which view is more reasonable? Number one or number two? What do you think? Yeah, number two, because you've got a miracle, but you've got someone doing the miracle. Number one is a miracle with no miracle worker. That's clearly absurd. Do you realize that everybody believes in at least one miracle? Christians believe in more than one. We believe in this and others. But atheists believe in one miracle. Many of them will admit, I believe no one created something out of nothing. Which takes more faith? Someone or no one? What do you think? In fact, Leibniz asked this question many years ago. If there is no God, why is there something rather than nothing at all? I mean, if there is no God, why does anything exist? Why do you exist? Why do I exist? Why does the universe exist? Why does root beer exist? Why, does, why do the Dallas Cowboys exist? That's what I want to know. If God, why evil? I mean, come on. Why do these things exist? Okay, look. If space, time, and matter literally had a beginning out of nothing, what could have caused that? Only something that's outside of space, time, and matter. In other words, the cause must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful to create the universe out of nothing, personal in order to choose to create. You say, why that? Because to go from a state of nothingness to a state of creation, someone had to make a choice, and only persons can make choices. Also, the being would have to be intelligent to have a mind to make a choice. Ladies and gentlemen, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? God. You say, well, how do you know it's a Christian God, Frank? We don't. Yet. I mean, this could be Allah or some other theistic God or deistic God. But if we keep going through the questions and we realize that Jesus actually did predict 
and accomplish his own resurrection from the dead, then we can say that the same being that walked out of the tomb 1,990 years ago is the same being in whose divine nature created the universe out of nothing. We haven't gotten there yet. But we have six attributes for what could be, could be, the God of the Bible at this point. All right, next argument is the argument from design. We'll spend a little bit more time on this one. And there's two aspects to this. The universe appears to be design, and you appear to be designed. Let's start with the universe first. Scientists have discovered in recent decades the universe is incredibly fine-tuned. That if you were to change any one of a number of factors virtually imperceptibly about our universe, either the universe wouldn't exist, or if it did exist, it couldn't support life. And again, even Stephen Hawking, the atheist, admitted this. Here's what he said. He said, if the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million, a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back on itself or never developed galaxies. In other words, if the expansion rate was that infinitesimally different from the very beginning, none of us would be here. You can't make any sort of evolutionary hypothesis that maybe the expansion rate evolved to this point by chance, whatever that means. Why? Because this is the initial expansion rate. It started there didn't evolve, it started right there at the perfect rate. Seems to me the same being that created space, time, and matter is the same being that fine-tuned the expansion rate precisely what it needed to be for us to exist. Also, the gravitational force, if it were altered by more than one in 10 to the 40th power compared to the strong nuclear force, we wouldn't be here. What's one in 10 to the 40th power? It's one part in one with 40 zeros following it. You say, Frank, I can't get my head around that number. I know, neither can I. Let me give you an illustration. Take the entire North American continent and stack it in dimes all the way to the moon. That's 238,000 miles. Then do that on a billion other North American continents. And then mark one dime red. Take all those billion piles, put them into one huge pile, mark that one dime red and mix it in with all those, di all those other dimes, blindfold a friend, throw him on the pile and tell him to randomly pick one dime. The chance that he would pick that one red dime is one chance in one in 10 to the 40th power. Is he gonna pick that dime? No. No. This value appears to be design. In fact, there's only, you say, well, couldn't chance account for it? Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, does chance cause things? Who caused this? Chance, he was just here. No. Chance is not a cause. Chance is a word we use to describe mathematical possibilities. Chance doesn't do a thing. When scientists use the word chance, you know what they mean? Uh, we don't know. Look, there's two possibilities for that value being right where it is. Either it was designed to be there or it wasn't. What makes more sense? What do you think? What's the odds on favorite? Yeah, somebody, and this is just one, by the way, out of about a dozen of these. Change any one of them, this imperceptibly, we don't exist. In fact, this one in 10 to the 40th power, you know how many seconds there, there's been in Earth history? 10 to the 17. This is 10 to the 40. By the way, how much, how much bigger is 10 to the 41 compared to 10 to the 40? 10 to the 41 is 10 times bigger than 10 to the 40. You see, these are exponential numbers. You can't even comprehend this kind of precision. And it's not just our universe that's fine-tuned. Our solar system appears to be fine-tuned with us in mind. Here we are, third rock from the sun. If we were just a little bit closer to or a little bit further away, we couldn't survive. A little bit closer to, we'd burn up. A little bit further away, we'd freeze. We are what scientists call the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It is? It's a lie. It's way too cold here in May. The axial tail, 23 and a half degrees. Change that slightly, we don't exist. Earth rotation, 24 hours. Change that slightly, we don't exist. The size and distance of the moon from us. Change that slightly, we don't exist. If Jupiter was not in its current orbit, we couldn't exist here. Why? What does Jupiter do for us? It attracts most of the meteors and space junk to it rather than us. It's a cosmic vacuum cleaner. That's how strong its gravitational force is. In fact, if you take a close-up look at Jupiter, these dark marks are comet fragment strikes that are bigger than the Earth. 
Thank God for Jupiter. Because if Jupiter wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. Same thing is true for Saturn, by the way. It helps us out by attracting space junk. In fact, you want to see the size of the planets? Check them out. Here we got in size, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth. Look at poor Pluto down here. You know, Pluto recently has been demoted as a planet. I don't know about you, but I think it's size discrimination. And what if Pluto identifies as a planet? What then, you bigots? <laughs> Take a look at this. You can hardly see Pluto. Take a look at this. That's Arcturus. It's another star in our galaxy. Here's our sun. Here's Jupiter. One pixel in size on this scale. Earth is invisible. Pluto, forget about it. All right, keep an eye on Arcturus now. Where's Arcturus? Now, see it way over here? That's Antares. That's another star in our galaxy. Here's the sun. It's one pixel in size on this scale. Jupiter is invisible. Earth, Pluto, forget about them. In fact, if the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse here would be five or six Empire State Buildings high. The heavens are awesome. And that's just in our galaxy. This is not outside our galaxy. And the average distance between stars in our galaxy is 30 trillion miles, and all that distance is necessary for us to exist here on Earth. Now, how far is 30 trillion miles? Far. It'll take you at least two tanks of gas and a Toyota Prius <laughs> to go 30 trillion miles. You guys remember when we used to put the space shuttle up before Elon Musk began putting stuff up and blowing it up in midair? Um, you remember when the space shuttle went around the Earth? You know how fast that thing was going? It was going 18,000 miles an hour. That's five miles per second. You got trouble getting to school in the morning? Take the space shuttle. You'll be at five miles a second. Think about how fast that is. Well, I did a little calculation to try and figure out how long would it take us if we could get in the space shuttle and go from our star, the sun, to another star inside our galaxy, an average distance away, 30 trillion miles. In other words, how long would it take us to go 30 trillion miles if we could go five miles per second? How long do you think? Anyone? A long time. You must be a math major. Yeah. It would take us 201,450 years. That means if you got in the space shuttle at the time of Christ and started traveling from our star, the sun, to another star an average distance away inside our galaxy, you've been going five miles a second for 200,000 years, you would be less than one hundredth of the way there right now. And we're going to explore space. No. I, I just said it wrong. I said if, you, if you've gone that fast for 2,000 years you'd be less than 100th of the way there. The heavens are awesome. And that's just between two stars in our galaxy. How many stars are there in the entire universe? Well, first of all, let's see what the psalmist says about this. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Well, how, how high are the heavens above the earth? The Hubble Space Telescope has helped us discover that. Can you see this uh, up here, this uh, slide. I don't know if you can see along the bottom here. This, these are mountains. This is the southern hemisphere. It's almost 20 years ago now. They trained the Hubble Space Telescope on 1 26 millionth of the sky. What's 1 26 millionth of the sky? Go outside tonight, put a piece of rice on the end of your finger, hold it up at arm's length. That piece of rice represents about 1 26 millionth of the sky. So they trained Hubble on this spot for like 11 days of exposure time. This is called Hubble Ultra Deep Field. You can Google this, it's in the public domain. I'm gonna show you what they found. They put this little video together to show you what they found in this little speck of sky. When I play the video, you're gonna see that constellations in the Southern Hemisphere come up and then, and then Hubble's gonna zoom out to that one tiny piece of sky. There's no audio, it's, or there's, there's no audio at all, it's just video. Are you guys ready? All right, here we go. Hubble Ultra Deep Field. There are the constellations. Let's see what they found.
what you're looking at are nearly 10,000 galaxies, each with billions of stars of their own in one twenty-six millionth of the sky. If you find w if you find 10,000 galaxies in 126 millionth of the sky how many stars are there in the entire universe The number of stars in the entire universe are about equivalent to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches on all the earth times 100,000 and to go from just one star to another star going five miles a second will take you to uh, over 200,000 years. Now you know why the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. If this is supposed to illustrate what infinity is like, it's a pretty good illustration, isn't it? But there's a big problem if this is true. The problem is, is that if this represents God's attributes, it means God is infinitely just. And if he's infinitely just, we're all in trouble. So what's he going to do? Here's the second half of the verse I showed you a minute ago. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. How has he removed our transgressions from us? If he's infinitely just, how can he not punish us? Thankfully, he's also, in addition to being infinitely just, he's infinitely loving. So he doesn't want to punish us. So what does he do? He comes to earth, he adds humanity to his deity, and he allows the creatures that rebelled against him to torture and kill him so he could take our punishment on himself. This is why Jesus is the only way, ladies and gentlemen. It's not an arbitrary claim. He's not just saying, I said so, that's why. There's no other way an infinitely just God can allow us to go unpunished unless he punishes an innocent substitute in our place. This is why the Apostle Paul could come along in Romans chapter 3, verse 26 and say, God is the just. He remains just and he's the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. He's still just because he punishes sin. But he doesn't punish us because he doesn't want to. He wants to redeem us. Now, when you think of stars equivalent to sand grains on 100,000 Earths, and it's going to take you over 200,000 years just to go between two of those stars, does that make you feel insignificant? It shouldn't. Why? Because as amazing as the heavens are, they're not made in the image of God. But you are. In fact, the heavens were made with you in mind. And here's the second aspect of the design argument. Not only are the heavens fine-tuned, but so are you. This is you in the womb at 11 weeks. Question, is this animal, mineral, vegetable, or human? In fact, let's go back even earlier than 11 weeks. Let's go all the way back to when your mother and your father got together to conceive you. Have you guys had this talk before? I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. I also see some older people in here, so I'll try and be discreet as well, just in case you've forgotten how this works. When your mother and your father got together to conceive you, your mother unconsciously perfumed her, e her egg to attract your father, and then your father sent the entire population of the United States, 300 million soldiers toward your mother's egg. And then there was a race, and you won. <laughs> Don't let anyone ever tell you you're not special. <laughs> you beat out 300 million others. Now, seeing some of you limp in here earlier makes it hard for me to believe you were the fastest soldier in the gene pool, but you were. Now, your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt, yet it contained half of the 3.5 billion letter software program, your genome, your DNA, all the letters in the right order. 
And your mother's egg was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in an average book, and it contained the other half of the 3.5 billion letter software program, your genome, your DNA, all the letters in the right order. And when your soldier and your egg came together, a new 100% genetic human being was created. You know, you have not received any more genetic information from this point till right now. Your genetic information has just duplicated itself. In fact, there were only four things separating you from adulthood. Time, air, water, and food. Those are the same four things that separate a two-year-old from adulthood. Does this have implications on the abortion issue? Yeah, I think it does. We don't kill the two-year-old. Why do we kill the unborn child in the womb? Genetically, it's the same. You say, wait a minute, Frank. You can't legislate morality. All right, no extra charge for this. This was the subject of our first book, creatively titled Legislating Morality. All laws legislate morality. Every law declares one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. The only question is whose morality will be legislated. And when people say, don't impose your morality on me, I go, why not? Would that be immoral? See, because you're imposing your morality on me right now. You're saying I ought not impose ought nots, but you're imposing that ought not on me. Why do you get to impose ought nots, but I can't? Actually, the better answer is this. If somebody says, don't impose your morals on me, I think you might want to say, these are not my morals. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't make up the fact that murder is wrong, that abortion is wrong, that rape is wrong, that theft is wrong, that men were made for women and women were made for men, and the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society, which is the reason the government's involved in marriage to begin with, is to legally recognize that man-woman relationship over every other relationship. I didn't make any of this stuff up. This isn't my morality. This isn't your morality. This just happens to be the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. The one the Apostle Paul said the Gentiles don't have the law of the law written on their hearts. Look, if you don't like the morality, you don't have a problem with me. I didn't make it up. You have a problem with the creator upon whose morality this nature, or upon whose nature this morality is derived. All right, no extra charge for that. Let's go back to this. From this point till right now, a construction project in you began taking place. Cells began multiplying at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of 100,000 cells per second, for most of you anyway. (laughs) Some cells became heart cells, others lung cells, others pancreas cells. How do you know how to do this? Nobody knows. Some cells went so far across you to become what they needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this very moment. You just made 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another four million new red blood cells. You just made another four million new red blood cells. Knock it off. I mean, are you even thinking about this? Are you going, wait a minute, Frank, I gotta concentrate. Hold on, new red blood cells coming up. No, this is just happening. How's it happening? Aristotle noticed something 2,400 years ago. He didn't know anything about blood cells, but he did notice that all of nature's going in a direction. For example, why? If an acorn is properly nourished, why does it always go in the direction of becoming an oak tree? Why doesn't it become an elm tree or a birch tree or a seahorse? You say, well, it's programmed to become an oak tree. Yeah, well, who programmed it? I mean, is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn in the ground thinking, all right, what do I have to do to become an oak tree? No. If it doesn't have a mind of its own, and it doesn't, yet it reliably goes in a direction, there must be an external mind directing it toward an end. That is what Aristotle called the unmoved mover. Thomas Aquinas came along in the 1200s AD and he said, this is gonna be my fifth way to argue for God. That if all of nature's going in a direction, someone must be directing it. Somebody must be sustaining it. Now notice, ladies and gentlemen, this is not the Big Bang argument. This is not the cause way back when. That's another argument. Aquinas and Aristotle are not talking. They mistakenly thought Aristotle did the universe was eternal. This is not a way back when cause. This is a right now cause. Every single second the universe exists, it's being maintained. It's being sustained. God creates the universe and he creates the natural laws that govern it and he creates you and he sustains the universe and the natural laws that govern it and he sustains you every single second. Have you ever asked yourself, why do the natural laws so consistent and persistent? Why don't they change? All physical things change. Why don't the natural laws that govern them change? This is why we can do science, ladies and gentlemen, because the world is orderly. It's reliable cause and effect. 
You wouldn't be able to even do science if there wasn't order and cause and effect. Where does that come from? In fact, God is to the universe what a band is to music. If a band were up here playing music, the band would be creating and sustaining the music. What would happen to the music the second the band stopped playing? Music would be over. Same thing is true with God. He creates and he sustains all this. This is why Paul said, in Christ we live and move and have our being, and Christ holds all things together. And the writer of Hebrews says, God sustains all things by his powerful word. This is a, a sustaining cause, in other words. Now, we've got to move on to the next argument. There's much more in the book, Stealing from God. We don't have it here, but on that argument. Let's talk now about the moral argument. And maybe the best way to introduce this is to ask you this question. How do you know that your quarterback throwing a touchdown is better than your quarterback throwing a pick six? That's when he throws it to the other team and they take it back for a touchdown. How do you know that? Not just the rules, more than the rules. What, do you, what else do you have to know? This is the interactive portion of the program. What, what else? What? Yeah, you've got to know the you got to know the goal of the game, right? You got to know the purpose of the game. If there's no goal of the game, you can't say this touchdown gets us closer to the purpose or goal and this pick 6 takes us further away. Only if you know the goal, you can say this is a good play cuz it takes us closer to, this is a bad play cuz it takes us further away. Now notice the purpose of the game comes from outside the game. When the Eagles and the uh, Chiefs played a few months ago out there in Arizona, they showed up in Arizona, the field set, refs are there, rules are set. They didn't make up the rules. They didn't make up the game. They didn't make up the purpose. Who did? The commissioner and the owners. And they get together every year and they tweak the rules a little bit. Why? Because in football, the rules are arbitrary. They can be different. But in life, the rules are not arbitrary. Because they come from God. They come from outside the game. The purpose and the rules come from outside the game. But if there is no purpose and there is no one outside the game to give us purpose and rules, then everything's just a matter of opinion. In fact, if there is no God, the Nazis were not wrong. That's just your opinion that they were wrong. It's just the Allies' opinion unless there's a God. If there is no God, love is no better than rape. Oh, you might like love better, but that's just your preference. If there is no God, there are no human rights. Have you noticed that we seem to be creating rights in this country about every 10 minutes? And yet many of the people claiming they have these new rights, they're atheists. There are no rights if there's no God. There's not only no right to same-sex marriage, there's no right to natural marriage. There's not only no right to abortion, there's no right to life. There are no rights unless God exists. And this, of course, is how our country began. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men were created and endowed by their creator, not government. Rights come from the creator. If they come from government, a new government can come in and take them away from you. That, that would mean they're not rights. That would mean they're preferences. In fact, if there is no God, murder, slavery, and racism are not wrong. But we all know they are wrong. So there must be a standard outside of us we're obligated to obey. It's not majority vote. If you're going to say majority vote gives you right and wrong, are you going to say that in the antebellum South, when they voted for slavery, that that made it right there? No, you're not going to say that. Or when the Nazis voted to murder the Jews, if in fact they did, of course they just put Hitler in on a plurality and then he decided to do that. I don't care, I don't care if they, they voted for that or not. It's not right. If there is no God, religious people have never done anything wrong. Yet if you're a religious people, I'm sure you've been called a hypocrite, right? You know, if there is no God, there's nothing wrong with being a hypocrite. There's nothing wrong with anything. In fact... I know they've probably called you a hypocrite. You know why they have? Because you are. So am I. We're all hypocrites. We're fallen. How many people in here know somebody? Maybe, maybe it's you. How many people know somebody who stayed away from Christianity because people in the church are jerks? Yeah, many of us have, right? John Dixon, who is an historian and now teaches at Wheaton, asks you to ask people who stay away from the church because Christians are jerks, just ask them this question. When somebody plays Beethoven poorly, who do you blame? Yeah, you don't blame Beethoven, right? So when somebody plays Jesus poorly, who do you blame? 
You don't blame Jesus. Look, just because I'm not true and beautiful doesn't mean Jesus isn't true and beautiful. Newsflash, Christianity is not Christians. Christianity is Jesus. Yeah, we're all fallen. You ought to expect Christians to be jerks quite a bit. Why? Because we're still fallen. And if we weren't, we wouldn't need them. By the way, if there is no God, tolerance is no better than intolerance. Hey, are Christians commanded to be tolerant? Be careful how you answer, Christians. Are you? No, why? Because tolerance is too weak. Tolerance says hold your nose and put up with them. You know what we're commanded to do? We're commanded to love. Love says reach out and help them. You know, unfortunately, in our culture, you know what we think love is? Love means approval. Love does not mean approval. How many people in here are parents? All right, how many people in here are former children? Oh, okay, good. That's all of us. Question. If you, when you were eight years old, if your parents approved of everything you wanted to do, would they have been loving? No, parents have to stand in the way of evil. You can't approve of everything somebody wants to do. You'd be an enabler. Functionally, you'd be hating them. Love does not mean approval. Love means seeking what's best for the other person, and quite frequently, that means you need to stand in the way of evil. As the great Thomas Sowell said, he said, when you want to help people, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. Why do we tell people what they want to hear? Because we don't want them mad at us when we try and help them. And so that's why we acquiesce. We enable them. We're helping ourselves when we do that. If we truly cared for them, we'd tell them the truth and take the blowback. And by the way, if there is no God, you can't complain about the problem of evil. Why can't you complain about the problem of evil? Because there is no evil if there is no God. Not because God is doing evil, but because God is the standard of good by which we'd even know what evil was. In fact, C.S. Lewis pointed out that good or, or evil requires good and good requires God. You know, he was an atheist early on in his life. He went through World War I. His best friend was killed in World War I. He said, there can't be a good God. There's too much injustice in the world. Then one day he had an epiphany and he realized his argument didn't work. And he ultimately put it in the book, Mere Christianity. Here's what he wrote. He said, as an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how would I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? You see, you wouldn't know what a crooked line was unless you knew what a straight line was. You wouldn't know what injustice was unless you knew what justice was. In other words, evil can't exist unless good exists. Because evil's not a thing in itself. Evil's a lack in a good thing. Evil is like cancer. If you take all the cancer out of a good body, you got a better body. What happens if you take all the body out of the cancer? You got nothing, right? Evil's like rust in a car. If you take all the rust out of a car, you got a better car. What happens if you take all the car out of the rust? You got a pinto. Come on, you know that. Doesn't exist. Or you could say it this way, the shadows prove the sunshine. In order to have shadows, you gotta have sunshine. In other words, in order to have evil, you have to have good. Oh, you can have, you can have sunshine without shadows. You can have good without evil, but you can't have shadows without sunshine. You can't have evil without good. So if evil exists, I know this is gonna sound counterintuitive, but it's true. If evil exists, God exists. Not because God is doing evil, but because he's the standard of good by which we'd even know what evil was. Now, if you wanna ask why does God allow certain evils, we can get to that in the Q&A. But right now, let's just point out that if evil exists, God does exist. And so Christopher Hitchens, how many know who Christopher Hitchens was? Anyone know who he was? He was a brilliant British atheist who sounded more brilliant than he was because he had a British accent, you know? And I had a couple of debates with him a number of years ago. This is a picture from one of our debates at the College of New Jersey. And Christopher said, God is not great how religion poisons everything. He's basically saying religion is evil. I kept asking him in the debate, what do you mean by evil, Christopher? He never would answer because he's got no standard by which to judge good and evil. And by the way, he's got it exactly backwards. Religion does not poison everything. Everything poisons religion. I poison religion because I can't live up to the pure words of Christ. In fact, in the second debate, this one at the College of New Jersey, I said to him, Christopher, I'm a hypocrite. I can't live up to what Jesus told me to live up to. But if I could, I wouldn't need him. If I was perfect, I wouldn't need a savior and so when people tell me I can't go to church because there's too many hypocrites down there, I always say, come on down, pal. We got room for one more. The church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a country club for saints. It would be like saying I can't go to the gym because there's too many out-of-shape people there. 
Well, that's why they're there. They're trying to get in shape. You get the idea? All right, so let's sum up these three arguments. What do we learn from these three arguments? From the cosmological argument, we can see that the first cause is spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, and intelligent. From the teleological argument, we get more evidence that he's intelligent. We also get the sense that he's sustaining the universe. And from the moral argument, we can see that this cause also is morally perfect. Now, ladies and gentlemen, from these three arguments, we have a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent creator who created all things and sustains all things and is morally upright. This is the God of the, the Bible, and we haven't even opened the Bible yet. This is called natural theology. You don't need the Bible to know that a being like this exists. You need the Bible to know if Jesus is the true God, if he resurrected from the dead. We're going to get to that here in a minute. But you can show that there's a God, and the Bible even teaches this. The invisible qualities of God are clearly seen so that we're without excuse. That's Romans chapter 1. So now, all we need to see to try and figure out who is the true God is go to number three. Are miracles possible? Is the New Testament true? And you're probably looking at your watch going, Frank, how are we going to finish this? We're running out of time. Actually, number three is real fast. Because if God exists, miracles are possible, right? However, people, some th people think miracles are impossible, like Noah. All right, Christians, can we all agree on one thing, even the Christians watching out there? That Noah and the ark is crazy. Can we admit that? I mean, it's crazy. And resurrections, I already asked you, have you ever seen anyone rise from the dead? Nobody said yes, yet if you're a Christian, you have to believe something none of us have ever seen. How rational is that? And for some reason, the big problem miracle in the Bible is Jonah. Is that a whale of a tail or a tail of a whale? What's the deal with Jonah? Can you really believe in Jonah? Ladies and gentlemen, what is the greatest miracle in the Bible? Yeah, the greatest miracle in the Bible is not the resurrection. The greatest miracle in the Bible is... I got some of you a second time. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, the greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Here's the interesting thing. Atheists are admitting the evidence for the first verse. Now, obviously, Hawking doesn't think it's God, but who else could it be? And if Genesis 1-1 really is true, are, are these other miracles at least possible? I mean, if God can create the universe out of nothing, can he do the Jonah miracle? Can he resurrect Jesus from the dead? Can he do, the, can he, uh, do Noah and Jonah and part the Red Sea? And, this is easy if God can create the universe out of nothing. Of course Noah's crazy, unless God exists. Of course Jonah's a fairy tale, unless God exists. He can do these things if he exists. And the evidence shows he does exist. Now, here's the problem, though, we have to deal with before we go on to the New Testament, and that's this. A lot of people won't believe in miracles because they've never seen one. That's not really a good reason to disbelieve something. Why? Because you believe in a lot of things you've never seen. Never seen your mind, yet you believe in it, right? You've never seen the laws of logic or the laws of, ma laws of mathematics, but you're using them. In fact, you're using them right now. You've never seen justice, Oh, you may have seen somebody treated justly or unjustly, but you've never seen justice in itself because it's an immaterial reality grounded in the nature of God. You've never seen love. Everyone believes in love. Oh, you may have loved somebody, you may have been loved, but you don't see it directly. It's indirect. In fact, in the um, second debate with Hitchens, some student at the College of New Jersey asked Christopher this question. Christopher, what is love? And Christopher, being a materialist, in other words, he believed all that exists are molecules. There's no immaterial realm. You don't have free will. You don't have a soul. You just have a body. You don't have a mind. You just have a brain. You're, you're nothing but a molecular machine. You're a moist robot. You know, every thought you have is a result of the laws of physics. That's his worldview. So when someone asks him what's love, he has to come up with a materialistic answer. You know what he said? He said, love is a chemical. And I said, don't tell that to your wife. Honey, do you love me? Yeah. Why? Because I got the chemical today. You know, tomorrow I might not have it. No, no, love is not a chemical. Love is an action grounded in the nature of God. It's to seek what's best for the other person. You've never seen gravity. Oh, sure, Frank, there it is right there. No, you're not seeing gravity. What are you seeing? You're seeing the effects of gravity. You know, we really don't even know what gravity is. 
And by the way, this is all we've been doing here all night is talking about effects. That's how you know that God exists. If someone were to ask you, how do you know that God exists? I think you ought to say, I know God by his effects. If there's a creation and there is, that's the effect. You're reasoning back to a cause, a creator. If there's design, that's the effect. You're reasoning back to a cause, a designer. If there's a moral law written on the heart, that's the effect. You're reasoning back to a cause, a moral law giver. If you have the ability to think and see things outside your brains, outside your minds, and make valid conclusions about the real world out there, that's the effect. You're reasoning back there must be cause, a great mind. If there's evidence that a man predicted and accomplished his own resurrection from the dead, that's the effect. You think, what could have caused somebody to come back from the dead? Only a being like God. You're reasoning from effect to cause. This is what scientists do. They find effects and they try and figure out what caused the effects. And traditionally, long before uh, the modern times, what was supposedly the queen of all sciences? Theology. Why? Because theology puts every single academic discipline under one big umbrella. When you come to university, you know what you're supposed to be getting? How to find unity and diversity. How to see all these different academic disciplines fit together under one big truth. We don't teach that anymore, but that's what we ought to be teaching. So miracles are possible. Just because you haven't seen it doesn't matter. You, I mean, you've never seen George Washington. Yet you believe he existed. Why? Because he's left effects behind that are best explained by a cause known as George Washington who lived from 1732 to 1799. Same thing is true with Jesus. You're going by effects and you're reasoning back to a cause. In fact, if you just think you have a personal experience with God, you're doing the same thing. The experience is the effect. Who's the cause? You're saying it's the Holy Spirit. You're saying it's God. And by the way, If miracles still occur today, and I think they do, although they don't have to for Christianity to be true, there could be no miracles since Jesus and the apostles' Christianity is still true. But even if miracles do occur today, you ought not expect to see many of them. Why? Because if miracles occurred all the time, we wouldn't consider them miracles. We'd say this stuff just happens all the time. I mean, imagine if resurrections occurred routinely. What would the resurrection of Christ mean to us? Nothing. You go to somebody and you go, Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was God. And the guy goes, so what? Uncle Leroy just rose from the dead two weeks ago. Now I got to give the inheritance back. No. It's got to be a rare event if it's going to get our attention. It can't be a regular event. If it's a regular event, it's not a miracle. Although there are things that happen to us, happens every day, and it's so dramatic, we should call it a miracle, but we don't because it happens every day. How many people in this room have seen your own flesh and blood born? Every mother should raise their hand, some of the dads, right? Now, when you see another human being come out of you that came from you, you don't go, evolution, right? You go, this is amazing. You know there's intelligence behind it, even though it happens every day. That's why we don't call it a miracle, but it's still dramatic. By the way, do you know, for atheism to be true, every single miracle claim and spiritual experience in the history of the world has to be false. Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. Is it reasonable to believe? I don't think so. All right, so miracles are possible. Now the key question, did the greatest miracle outside of the first verse The greatest miracle in the Bible after the creation event actually occur, and that is the resurrection. Because if the resurrection occurred, it's a short step to saying Christianity is true and the Bible is the word of God. So do we have any evidence that Jesus rose from the dead? In the book, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. We have a chapter called the top 10 reasons we know the New Testament writers told the truth. We don't have time for that. I just have time to show you maybe two, briefly. And the first one we're going to look at are embarrassing stories. What are embarrassing stories? Embarrassing stories are those stories that are told, and historians know this, that when they read a story in an ancient text or just an historical text, if it's embarrassing to the author or authors, it's probably true. Why? Because you're not going to make up things that embarrass you. You might make up things that make you look good, but you won't make up things that make you look bad, right? In fact, let me ask you guys a question here. How many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look good? If you don't have your hand up right now, you're lying to make yourself look good. And it's not working. We know you're lying. 
All right, how many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look bad? Yeah, you don't do that. You might lie to make yourself look good, but you won't lie to make yourself look bad. In other words, you won't lie to embarrass yourself. Well, the New Testament writers, this is true of the Old Testament as well, but we're just looking at the New Testament. The New Testament writers have filled the New Testament with embarrassing stories that they never would have invented. That's why we call this the dove factor. They're not making this up. I mean, think about their leader, Peter. He's called Satan by Jesus. Do you think Mark, who wrote this down, said to Peter at one point, hey, Pete, I'm going to make this a real interesting story. I'm going to have the Lord call you Satan. What do you think Peter would have said? Have him call you Satan. Look, I'm the leader here. This is embarrassing. And then Peter says, Lord, I'll never deny you. What does he wind up doing? He winds winds up denying him three times. And then at the crucifixion, all the disciples, maybe with the exception of one, they all run away for fear of the Jews. And then, I mean, this is like a Monty Python movie when you think about it. Run away. They all run away. And who are the brave ones? The women. The women are the brave ones. Now, who wrote the New Testament documents down? Men. Now, what man? Is going to invent that he was hiding for fear of the Jews why the women went down to discover the empty tomb. Would any man in here invent that? I mean, if I was there and inventing it, I'd make myself look good. Wouldn't you guys do that? I mean, I'd write something down like this. Let's see, we marched right down there and we overpowered that elite Roman guard. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. What do you think? Yep. John said, get out. Peter, roundhouse kicked him. (laughs) Thomas said, we'll be back. No doubt. And then on Sunday morning, we marched right down to the tomb, and we saw Jesus who congratulated us on our great faith. And then we went and comforted the trembling women. I would never say it was Mr. Sissy Pants, why the women went down to go to the empty tomb. Oh, no, by the way, why would you never say the women were the first witnesses in that culture? I mean, forget about the fact it was embarrassing to men. It was. But independent of that, why would you never say the women were the first witnesses? Anyone? That's right. The women were not considered as reliable as men in a court of law. So if you're only making up the New Testament resurrection story, you'd only have the men be the first witnesses. Yet all four gospels say the women were the first witnesses, which is telling us what? They really were as embarrassing as it was. In fact, one of their star witnesses was a formerly demon-possessed woman. Gee, what a credible witness you got there. Let's put her front and center. What did you see, ma'am? No. No. They're not making it up. I, 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 I can't even believe this is in there, but it is. Actually, one, a woman came up to me once and she said, Frank, I know why Jesus appeared to the women first. And I said, why? And she said, because he wanted to get the story out. I said, that is an excellent point. I hadn't thought of that. Because ladies, when your man comes home from work, does he say much? <laughs> there could have been a nuclear explosion down at the plant. He's not going to tell you. You'll see it on the news before you hear it from him. You'll be watching the news going, hey, hon, what happened? Oh, yeah, forgot to tell you. Nuke blew up. I've been hot for three days. What's for dinner? He's not going to tell you. I can't even believe this next verse is in the New Testament, but it is. Do you know the... uh, the Great Commission story at the end of the biography we call the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus takes all of his disciples up on the hill in Galilee there and he's about to tell them, give them you know, their marching orders, the Great Commission for the rest of their lives and he's standing there and he says, go therefore make disciples of all nations. Notice he doesn't say make believers. He says make disciples, there's a difference. Anyway, it says right there in verse 17 about the disciples he's talking to, it says some believed but some doubted. What? He's standing resurrected right in front of them. And they're going, you see that guy over there? Yeah. That guy over there is Jesus. Oh, no, it can't be Jesus. He was just killed not long ago. No, I'm telling you, it's him. No, Jesus is dead. It can't be him. It's him. It can't be Jesus. You know, the Romans, they put nails in him. They whipped him. They put a spear in his side. Blood and water came out. I'm telling you, Jesus is dead. It's him. It can't be. It is. How do you know? The women told me. They're not making this up. There's even potentially embarrassing details about Jesus in there. Jesus, according to his family, is considered out of his mind. His family thinks he's nuts, according to Mark chapter 3. You may have heard, oh, the New Testament writers embellish Jesus to be God. Really? Then why is Mark chapter 3 in there? 
That's embarrassing. Also, Jesus, his own brothers don't believe in him. They don't think he's the Messiah. They don't think he's God. By the way, how many people in here have a brother? And how many people have a brother who thinks he's God? Yeah, yeah, you don't believe in him either. Neither did G James until later, after he resurrects from the dead, then James actually dies as a martyr for him. But up to that point, it's embarrassing. Jesus is called a madman. He's called a drunkard. He's called demon-possessed. You think they invented that? He has his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute, which easily could have been seen as his sexual advance. And oh, by the way, notice there are two prostitutes in Jesus' bloodline. The Messiah's bloodline. Who are they? Rahab and Tamar. Tamar plays a prostitute. You think Matthew, when he put together the genealogy, said, you know what? I really think I ought to spice up the Messiah's bloodline a little bit. Let's put a couple of prostitutes in here. What do you think, Rahab, Tamar? No, he's just telling the truth. In fact, there's a lot of embarrassing people in the bloodline of the Messiah. Who? Judah, from where we get the term Jew from? Jesus, a descendant of the tribe of Judah. That's where we get Jew from. Who was Judah? Judah was evil. Judah's the guy that sold Joseph into slavery. And he's in the bloodline of the Messiah. And then he winds up sleeping with Tamar. Yet he's in the bloodline. David, David, a man after God's own heart. Yeah, but he's a liar, adulterer, and a murderer. Gee, guess there's hope for the rest of us then, huh? Bathsheba's in there. Yet when Matthew gets to her in the genealogy, he doesn't mention her name. What does he say, in, what does he say instead? Does anyone know? Uriah's wife. Ooh. He's telling the truth, but it's a slam. Who was Uriah? Husband of Bathsheba, whom David had so he could have, who David had killed so he could have Bathsheba. And then Jesus is hung on a tree, despite the fact that anyone who's hung on a tree is under God's curse. If you're making up a Messiah to the Jews, you don't hang him on a tree. Why? Because according to Deuteronomy 21, 23, that man is under God's curse. Well, Jesus was under God's curse. What curse? The curse of sin we put him under. But if you're making this up, you wouldn't say that. In fact, for those of you who are stu students of the Bible, let's go back to Genesis. What are the two trees in Genesis? Two of them, what are they? Tree of life, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Fast forward all the way to the end of Revelation. There's one tree left. What is it? Tree of life. Do you know there's a tree in the middle? It's the tree upon which they hung Jesus. Because we sinned at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the only way we're going to have access to the tree of life is through the blood of Jesus. But if you were making this up, you would never say this is the way God saved the world. It's not an invented story, especially for Jews. There's a lot more on embarrassing details. We've got to do one more, and that's excruciating deaths. And this is the argument that says that these men who were in a position to know whether Jesus had resurrected or from the dead or not died excruciating deaths when they could have saved themselves by saying it never happened. Now, you need to understand that the people that wrote the New Testament documents, all of them were Jews, with the exception of Luke. Luke's the only Gentile. They thought they were God's chosen people. There are two things they didn't believe in the first century, that a man could claim to be God, that was blasphemy, and that someone would come in the middle of time and resurrect from the dead. They knew everyone would resurrect at the end of time, according to Daniel 12, but they didn't think a man could claim to be God and resurrect from the dead. And yet, these Jews then decide they're going to say that's exactly what happened and then go to their deaths after changing their long-held beliefs. Why? In fact, you might ask yourself the question, what did the New Testament, uh, New Testament writers have to gain by making up a new religion. What did they get by saying Jesus had resurrected from the dead? They got kicked out of the synagogue and then they got beaten, tortured, and killed. Last time I checked, that was not a list of perks. Right? We're going to start a new religion. We are? Yeah, what's it going to get us? First we'll get kicked out of the synagogue, then we'll get beaten, tortured, and killed. Well, sign me up. What a great idea. No, I don't think so. In fact, they had every motive to say the resurrection did not happen, not every motive to say it did you know, I get the question, maybe you get the question if you're a Christian. Are there any non-Christian writers that talk about Jesus and the apostles? Yes. They're all in chapter 9 of I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. You can read about them. Josephus, Suetonius, Thallus, Phlegon, household names. Right? But they're not eyewitnesses. Nevertheless, they do provide some corroborating data. But you know what is often underneath that question? There's an illicit assumption. What's the illicit assumption? You can't trust these people because, you see, these people were biased. They had an agenda. 
You can only trust the non-Christian writers to know what really happened. If you think about this for more than 10 seconds, you'll realize how stupid this is. What motive did they have to make this up? Now, some of you may know my friend Jay Warner Wallace. Do you guys know him? Cold case homicide detective. He's been on Dateline more than any other homicide detective because he solves murders decades old. Jim also became a Christian at 35 after being a cop for so many years. And he uses his cold case skills to investigate the greatest homicide of all time, the homicide of Jesus. And if you go to coldcasechristianity.com, you can see about his book. He's got several books, and he's also uh, got this website that's very good. And Jim says that whenever he finds a body that's been murdered, he says, I know that that guy's dead for one of only three reasons, or a combination of these three. I don't have to track down a thousand motivations as to why this guy's dead. That guy's dead for one of these three reasons, or a combination of the three. There was either a sex issue, a money issue, or a power issue. Sound familiar? That's what drives people to murder. It also drives the rest of us to sin. Because sex, money, and power are good things. They're so good, we'll take shortcuts to get them. So what Jim says is, he says, if you're going to try and say the New Testament writers of the, of the New Testament, the, the Jewish writers of the New Testament, invented this, you've got to find one or more of those three motivations. So let's take a look. Ladies and gentlemen, did the writers of the New Testament suddenly get real popular with the ladies? for saying Jesus had resurrected from the dead. No, didn't get sex. Did they get money? No, they weren't 21st century prosperity gospel preachers. Did they get power? No, they got the opposite. They got persecuted. Saul, later became Paul, had power when he persecuted the church. As soon as he becomes a Christian, he's the one persecuted. They didn't get sex. They didn't get money. They didn't get power. They had no motive to invent this. Why would they die for a known lie? At this point, you got to say, time out, Frank. If you're going to say martyrdom is evidence for Christianity, don't you have to say martyrdom is evidence for Islam? And the answer is no. Why? Because there's a lot of differences between the Muslim martyrs of today and the New Testament martyrs of New Testament times. But let me just give you one difference for our purpose today. The Muslim martyrs of today haven't witnessed anything that tells them that Islam is true. They just have faith. The New Testament martyrs, on the other hand, witnessed Jesus risen from the dead. They saw Jesus. They touched Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They verified with their own senses that Jesus had risen from the dead. Some people will die for a lie they think is the truth. No one will die for a lie they know is a lie. And the New Testament writers were in a position to know whether it was a lie or not, and they went to their deaths anyway. You can't get better evidence than that unless you were there yourself. All right, last thing I'm going to say on this, and it's going to sound like heresy for those of you who are Christians and believe the Bible's inerrant like I do, but it's not. Stick with me. Christianity is not true because a series of documents we put under one binding we call the Bible says it's true. In fact, Christianity would be true if the Bible never existed. You say, how can that be? Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line of the New Testament was ever written? Why? Because they didn't read about it in a book. They saw Jesus. They touched Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They knew he had risen from the dead. They didn't read about it in a book. Christianity did not originate with a book. Christianity originated with an event, the resurrection. There would be no books written by Jews in the first century claiming a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead unless a man really did claim to be God and really did rise from the dead. In fact, we could put it this way. The New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. You wouldn't have these documents written by Jews in the first century claiming this unless it really happened. There's no motive to invent it. There's every motive to say it wasn't true, not every motive to say it was. In fact, many Jews said it wasn't true, right? Like Caiaphas, to keep his power. So, there's more evidence we don't have time to cover. Let's talk about the big picture, though. Does truth exist? The answer is? Someone says there's no truth, you're going to say? 
Is that true? Does God exist? First argument, cosmological. Second, teleological. Third, moral. From those three arguments, you get the attributes of God. Are miracles possible? Yeah, greatest miracle of all has already occurred. What is it? Yeah, Genesis 1-1. The universe exploded into being out of nothing. If that verse is true, other verses are at least possible. Do we have evidence that Jesus rose from the dead, that the New Testament's telling the truth? I just showed you two out of ten lines. I think it takes more faith to believe he didn't rise from the dead than to believe he did. So if you want to go further, I want to give you this entire PowerPoint presentation. All you need to do is text that word evidence to this phone number, 855-909-0582. Those folks on the internet can do the same thing. Text the word evidence to 855-909-0582. All the slides I showed you plus a lot more. In fact, I showed you maybe 80 slides tonight. There's 362 to the entire presentation. So if you want the whole thing in a PDF format, just text that word. And I'm going to send you that PowerPoint presentation and about five others for free. And we have some books available on the book table. Uh, and all the proceeds from the sale of the books and the DVDs will go to feed needy children. Mine. Okay, just so you know, I got some sun, so I need some help. We've been talking about this book right here. There's a 12-part DVD series that goes with it. It's about seven hours long. People use it for homeschool, small groups, that kind of thing, even curricula in high school, so you may want to check that out. Also, we're teaching online courses now. If you go to crossexamine.org, you can click on online courses. I'm in the middle of teaching one now. Other people like Elisa Childers, Jay Warner Wallace I just had up there. Uh, Sean McDowell, Gary Habermas, several others, Stephen Meyer, they all teach courses with us. We're on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. In fact, we've combined these three into one social media platform. We call it You Twit Face. <laughs> it's kind of a Jersey thing, which is where I'm from originally. Have you signed up for You Twit Face yet? Actually, we're on Instagram and TikTok too. Don't forget about the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast, the TV show. And if you don't do anything else, just download. The free cross-examined app, two words in the app store. It's got the TV show streaming. It's got the podcast on it. It even has a quick answer section. So you might be uh, having lunch with somebody, and they say so that something wrong with Christianity. You're not quite sure how to answer it. All you, knew, all you need to do is take out your iPhone or take out your droid and go, hey, hang on. I'm getting a text. Hey, what about this? Right there on your phone, Okay. All right, before your questions, here is the last thing. It's true. So what? So what if Christianity is true? Well, the best news of all, somebody actually did die for you. Now, when I was in the Navy, I was in naval aviation. We had to earn golden wings, which were fairly hard to earn, but there's nothing more difficult in the Navy to earn than a golden trident. Very few people that start SEAL training make it through, maybe 5%. Those that do make it through wear that trident with pride. It is their identity. When Michael Monsor was buried in Rosecrans Cemetery in San Diego, California, just about every Navy SEAL on the West Coast showed up for his funeral. And when they passed his casket, they took off their tridents and they pressed them into his casket. They took their identity and put their identity in the one that died for them, the one that sacrificed for them. That's what we're supposed to do. But our culture says, oh no, put your identity in your political party or put your identity in your sexual orientation or your gender identity or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your bank account or your vocation. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that none of those things are ultimate, that you can lose every one of those things? If you put your identity and your sexual preference. What happens when you can't sexually perform anymore? Or you're no longer sexually preferred? You no longer have an identity? If you put your identity in your job, what happens when you lose your job? You no longer have an identity? You put your identity in another person. What happens if that other person leaves you or God forbid dies? You no longer have an identity? Do you realize that in Christianity, you don't achieve your identity, you receive your identity? If you have to achieve your identity, all the pressure's on you. And there's always someone that can do it better. And there's going to be a point where you can't do it anymore. You know, you can lose everything in this life. You can lose your spouse, God forbid. You can lose your children. You can lose your ability to perform in a number of ways. You can lose your money, your fortune, your health. 
you're ultimately going to lose your life unless Christ comes before that. The only thing you can't lose is the one that sacrificed himself for you and the one that rose again. Those are the only, that's the only thing you can't lose. You can't lose Jesus. So why would you put your identity in any, anything that's fleeting? It's going to be gone. Now, with that said, we're going to go to questions, but before we do, I want Tim to tell the group here about Ratio Christi because if you enjoy this kind of investigation into evidence, we, we do this on campus uh, every week, at least Tim does. So he's going to tell you about the club, and I know it's toward the end of the semester, but that's okay. You can sign up and stay on their email list. So next semester, you can come back and maybe get involved. Go ahead, Tim. Tell them about it. Mm-hmm. Also, one other thing I did not mention is um, please give a thank you to uh, Durham Ev- Evangelical Church because they're the ones that provided the great food and also for InterVarsity for spreading the word too. Um, yeah. And uh, I think two other things, if you really enjoy these t- kinds of topics, please do come to Rosho Christi because this is our pretty much bread and butter. We love to um, give you these, uh, or to provide a f- space for you to ask these difficult and challenging questions, um, as well as provide you good, solid answers. Um, I'm also going to say with when it comes to questions and answers, just so that everyone knows, um, questions are not monologues or mm-hmm. statements. You ask a question, you get an answer. Please don't um, ramble on. We want everyone to be able to get time to ask a question, so please be respectful of others. And, yeah, just be respectful. Thank you. Hey, Tim, when do you meet? Um, So currently we meet uh, 7 to 9 p.m. When uh, and where? Wednesdays. Okay. Usually the room would depend, so if you want to be up to date on that, please look at Wildcat Link. We'll try to keep that updated. Okay. Um, Yeah, we'll also just go to the table. We'll try to get more information to you for that. And where is Durham Evangelical Church? Where is that? Down 108. Down 108, how far? Okay. All right. If you guys are looking for a church, check it out. Durham Evangelical Church. What's the first? What are the services Sunday? Nine and ten thirty. Nine and ten thirty. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. Questions, anyone? And you got to go to the microphone because we are streaming, so no one will hear you if you uh, don't come to the microphone. And if you do come up to the microphone, um, you can wait uh, behind the person in front of you. You don't have to wait till the person sits down. Okay. So uh, no one likes to ask the first question, so we're moving right on to the second question. <laughs> second question. Yes, sir. Beautiful. We, we, got the first, we got the second question asked by the first person. <laughs> yes, sir. What's your name? All right. Uh, hi, I'm Daniel. Daniel, go ahead, yes. sir. Um, I'm a Christian, but I'm going to maybe reel a little against a little bit of what you said here just mm-hmm. um, for the sake of argument. I, with regards to the historical accuracy of the Bible, I know you addressed the motives of the authors of the of the Bible, but um, you didn't ever really address the possibility that that the actual events of Jesus' life were like obfuscated in some way, that the details may have been altered because there was a brief time of maybe like 50 years after he died before that, um, you know, the Bible was rec- recorded. So, do you have anything to address that? Yes. Uh, good question. <laughs> It, would, it wouldn't be 50 years. That's a, that's a long time. Well, it's actually not a long time based by ancient historical standards, but we would say 50 years. Well, that's a long time. Uh, the Should world-renowned expert on the resurrection, the guy who's written more about it and is right now in the middle of publishing his 5,000-page magnum opus is Dr. Gary Habermas, who's taught at Liberty University for years. And Gary has identified at least 41 creeds in the New Testament. What are creeds? They are short sayings that people memorized before they were actually put into writing. And probably the most important one is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. And that creed right there in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8, talks about who Jesus appeared to. 
And there are, I think, 17 or 18 people he appeared to, plus he talks about the 500 Jesus appearing to. And that creed is admitted early, even by liberal scholars. They think it's pre-40 AD. Some say it's as early as a month or two after the resurrection. It's very early. So just because it, it wasn't written down didn't mean that it wasn't secure testimony. And there's a difference, by the way, between written testimony and living testimony. Um, if, say, you wanted to, um, let's just pick somebody out of the, out of the air. Let's just say uh, you wanted to know what happened during the George W. Bush uh, presidency. What kind of events occurred in that presidency? Would you rather go talk to George W. Bush and the people around him and people who were there at the time, or would you rather read about it in a book? Presumably talk to them. Yeah, I'd rather talk to them too, right? Then you can ask whatever you want and go back and forth, right? And that's what this kind of living testimony was. Early on, they didn't think there was a need to write it down mm -hmm. because some of them may have thought the world was coming to an end very quickly. And they would rather talk to the eyewitnesses than read about it. And in that culture, by the way, the majority of people were illiterate. They could not read, so that's the way they got information. But that didn't mean they didn't have great memories. They did. They could memorize great tracts of, of information. So from a living memory perspective or living witness perspective, they, like you and I, would want to talk to the individuals. When the, as time went on, they saw a need to write it down, particularly because the churches were spreading along the, along, uh, easy for me to say, around the ancient world, the Mediterranean. Paul established many of those churches, and then he decided, I've got to write these people letters. Okay, so this is early material, even though it may not have been written down right away, because you've got the creeds, you've got the people who are eyewitnesses who were there, and other witnesses to make sure that what was written down was accurate. Does this make sense? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good question, Daniel. Also, you have to, you, you also have to look at the, uh, at the uh, motivation if you can figure it out, what motive would they have to invent this? I don't see any motive to invent any of this, particularly if you're Jews. You don't, you, this is the kind of thing you don't believe, not the kind of thing you do believe. Yes. Did you say Isaac? Yeah, Isaac. Go ahead, Isaac. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of had a quick question regarding baptism. Regarding um, what? Baptism. Baptism, yeah. yeah. yeah just because. Uh, I'm for it. You're for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because it's, it's, it's pretty disputed in the Christian circle. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just wondering with regard to like the Great Commission in Matthew 18, like, yeah. do you believe it's a command? Is it optional? Oh, just it's curious. certainly a command. Go, therefore, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. And Lord, with you always, even to the end of the age. That's a command. Yeah. The question that more people ask is, is it required for salvation? Does baptism save you? And if, if so, or if not, um, how are you saved? Is that the kind of question? Is that the yeah, angle yeah, you're going that, that's at it? Now, Christians disagree yep. over this, but I think that while water baptism is a command, if for some reason you don't get water baptized, you can still be saved. And how, um, wh how do I know that? Well, there's a couple of ways you can know it. First of all, Paul uh, says in 1 Corinthians 1, because he, one of the reasons he's writing to Corinth is they're disputing uh, there's factions. Some people follow Paul in the church of Corinth. Others follow Apollos and, you know, maybe other people. And Paul's writing, hey, I didn't die for you. You know, Jesus is, is, the, uh, is the Savior, not me, not Apollos. And he said, I didn't even come to baptize. I came to preach the gospel. I don't even remember who I baptized. You're arguing over who, who baptized who. I don't even remember who I baptized. I came to preach the gospel. And then you go to Romans 1, and in Romans 1, he says the gospel saves. So in 1 Corinthians 1, he's saying baptism isn't part of the gospel. He came to preach the gospel. And in Romans 1, he says the gospel saves. So that would tell me that baptism is not part of the gospel. It's a command you follow after you have become saved. It's a witness to everyone, but it doesn't get you saved. It's just an, an indication that you are saved. And then, of course, you could also talk about the thief on the cross. Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't get baptized. So I, I don't think baptism is necessary for salvation. I think it's a command that you ought to do. But if for some reason, you know, say you just got saved and you're on your way to your baptism and you get, you know, you get in a car accident and die. Are you saved? Of course you are. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Thank All you. Right. All right. Thanks. Good question, Isaac. All right. All right. Anyone else? 
You don't have to wait for people to sit down before you get up. So somebody should get up behind this guy right now, okay? <laughs> yes, sir, what's your name? Uh, Brother Frank, how are you? Hey, what's your name? Uh, Chad Clark. Chad, go yeah. ahead, sir. Uh, I just had a question. Um, why can't, I know what Paul says in, in his letter to Timothy, but why can't women be leaders in the church? Or We're pastor? totally out of time. Past it. Chad. <laughs> We are just completely out of time. <laughs> Here's another thing that Christians it's a, argue I know it's over. a touchy subject now. Sure it is, so yeah. Wanted, yeah. Um, you know who's done a real good work on this is Mike Winger. Do you know who Mike Winger is? No. <laughs> That's Mike's the brother audience. right there. <laughs> There's Mike's brother right there. Mike yeah. Winger is the Bible thinker on YouTube. And how long is that one he did on, on women in the church? Like three hours? Six hours. Six hours. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, there's a lot of nuance to it. Uh, let's, let's, let's take the traditional viewpoint that women are not to be the senior pastor. Right. Okay, I don't see any problem why that should be the case. We're, we're complementary. We have different gifts and different functions. And Kathy Keller, who's married to Tim Keller in New York, you know, the New York pastor, Tim Keller, who does, uh, his sermons are great. I, I think Tim Keller is very insightful into the passages. By the way, you need to pray for him. He's got pancreatic cancer. But in any event, Kathy Keller says this. She says that, Jesus, although he was equally God as the Father, submitted to the will of the Father. Are we going to say that we can't follow in our Lord's footsteps if we're a woman? But also notice, by the way, that the Father never told the Son to do anything immoral and to do anything wrong. And this also goes to the headship of the family. Ladies, if your husband tells you to do something immoral, you don't do it. Your, your, your allegiance is to Christ through him if he's leading the house properly. But if he is being, if he's telling you to do something immoral, no, you don't do it. But there has to be, and C.S. Lewis has written about this actually in Mere Christianity when he talks about the fact that in a constitution of two, there can't be uh, a one and one vote. Someone's got to have the deciding vote. So who is it? And God has chosen the man to do that. So I would look into Mike Winger's treatment of it. He gets into it in great depth, but it seems rational to me that God has different functions for different people in the church, just like he gives people different gifts, and I don't see any, anything wrong with that. I don't see any reason, just like Christ submitted to the Father, a woman can submit to her husband if her husband treats her properly, according to the, according to the scriptures. Okay, All right. thank you. All right, good question, Chad. Never bring it up again. <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Philip, and hopefully this question makes sense. Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. But I'm just wondering. I appreciate your first question of like whether truth exists, mm -hmm. uh, and kind of your emphasis on how like the truth is important. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my question is, what's kind of the undergoing foundation, undergirding foundation to say that living by the truth and pursuing the truth is what's good? Because um, I guess, like, say, with the advent of, like, AI, um, mm. sometimes it can be really nice to live in a lie, you know, or to have, uh, yeah, to just, if you, you know, believe that your parents loved you, if they really didn't, then that's, you know, a nice lie. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. And, and stuff like that. Um, and there's some truth that hurts, like, mm -hmm. if you're working at a job and somebody's just better at you, so then they get the job and then you're out of a job, mm -hmm. you know, that truth kind of sucks and you wish it wasn't true so i guess my question is yeah what's kind of the undergirding foundation to say we should pursue the truth and that not pursuing the truth will always like lead to harm well sometimes not pursuing the truth doesn't lead to harm as you just pointed out like for example you can lie and get out of some negative consequences right and it's not the truth yeah but you've damaged yourself in doing so. Short term, you had a victory. Long term, you didn't. You should be more concerned about what happens to you in the long term to your character than you should, well, I just avoided that negative consequence right there. So yeah, there are times when you don't pursue the truth and it works out for you short term. The question is long term. Je Jesus, of course, famously said that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free what does that imply though if you don't have the truth you're in bondage and i always ask audiences um if you pursue your heart and whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it do you think you're going to live freely 
long term? Because I can tell you that anyone who's addicted to pornography started by following his heart. Anyone that got addicted to drugs started by following his heart. Anyone that got involved in a kind of crime that thought would work out for him started by following his heart. Anyone that got involved in an adulterous relationship followed his heart. We're not supposed to follow our hearts unless our hearts are congruent with God's heart. We're supposed to follow the truth. And this is why I think, Philip, the most important Bible verse in the Bible for today's culture, other than the gospel itself, comes from the Old Testament. It's Proverbs 4.23, and it says, Above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. Above all else. doesn't say follow your heart. It says guard your heart. So we need to guard our hearts from going down the wrong path. And it's tempting to go down the wrong path. Why? Because short term it's going to work out. Long term it's not. And even if, it, even if you could get away with it long term. A lot, of people do, a lot of people get away with murder. They go to the graves and they never get justice, right? But what's happened to them in eternity? Unless they've repented, they're getting justice. So I see where you're coming from. I see that th- it's tempting to not tell the truth. It's tempting to go down a way that's going to be convenient, but long term it's not going to work out, and it's the wrong thing to do. It's a sin, of course, against God. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, right. thank you. All right, thank you, Philip. Insightful question. Hope I told him the truth. <laughs> yes, sir, go ahead. Hey, I'm John. Hey, John. Um, one of the things you talked about was the moral argument for the existence of God. Yes. Um, and that's, I've had a lot of conversations with people at UNH about that, and one thing I keep finding is, like, I, I get to the point where, like, you're kind of talking about how if there is no God, then Hitler wasn't truly wrong. Like, mm-hmm. it's just our society has won, and therefore, like, that's the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've had a number of people respond saying, yeah, I'm totally fine with Hitler not being objectively wrong. Mm-hmm. I don't, and I, I don't know where to go with the conversation after that. Two words. Get help. <laughs> really. In fact, Jay Bujashevsky, who is a brilliant philosopher who teaches at UT Austin, 20 years ago wrote a book called What You Can't Not Know, meaning on the big issues, everybody knows murder's wrong, or on the big moral issues like murder, theft, rape, everyone knows those things are wrong. You can be talked out of them. You can have your conscience seared and not know it anymore, but as soon as you're old enough to know what murder is, and as soon as you're old enough to know what wrong is, you know murder's wrong. And he used to have students come to him and say, oh, how do we even know murder's wrong? And Bujashevsky would say, he would try and convince him that murder's wrong, and then he said, I'm I'm not going to do that anymore. You know why? I can't convince them of something they already know. I just need to remind them of it. So he says, now, you really don't have any doubt that murder's wrong, do you? If they're honest, what are they going to say? That it's wrong. Yeah, that it's wrong. The Holocaust? You know what you ought to say? Why don't we uh, go on YouTube and watch some old video from Auschwitz and see how long you can watch that and maintain that attitude? Because they're not going to be able to do it unless they're totally, their mind's totally blown. Their conscience is completely seared. Because, you know, the same thing happened in a debate I had with uh, David Silverman, who was the president of the American Atheists at the time. Yet he was, a, he was a Jewish, but he was an atheist. And at one point in the debate, I said, hey, David, if there's no God, the Holocaust wasn't really wrong. And he tried to avoid that conclusion, but I kept pressing it on him. And you can see this debate on our YouTube channel. He finally said, you know what, Frank, the Holocaust isn't really wrong. And I said, David, you know with more certainty the Holocaust was wrong than you know that atheism's true. So why would you be an atheist? You shouldn't. In fact, you know certain moral principles better than you know most scientific principles. You know that torturing babies for fun is wrong more than you know if we have a proper view of electrons right now, don't you? Of course you do. So I wouldn't play the game with them. I would just say, you know murder's wrong. You know the Holocaust is wrong. If you want to deny that, 
you're being dishonest with yourself. And I think I can prove it to you. Let's go watch some video. Thank you. All right. Thanks, John. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. What's uh, your name? First, uh, Caleb. Caleb, go ahead, yeah. sir. Yeah, hi. So first of all, thank you for what you do, and um, thank you for being willing to uh, debate because I'm, I'm certain that it's not always the most comfortable thing to do, and it can be difficult to do at times. Only with my wife. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> all right, um, so there are a lot of questions I could ask you, um, but I guess just for the sake of... Uh, conversation. I'll, I'll kind of zone in on one smaller topic. There were some bigger topics that people brought up earlier that are more theological. Okay. So there's this guy named A.N. Wilson. I'm yep. sure you know who he is. He mm -hmm. wrote this book, Jesus, A Life. Mm -hmm. um, interesting points in them, in, in that book. Um, and, you know, again, I'm sure we could go on for at least an hour on the different points that he makes. Uh, but just I'll zone in on just one because it's interesting to me. So he thought that, OK, it seems to me from reading the texts in the old uh, in the New Testament that Jesus seemed to think that the end was coming very soon. And like, for instance, I guess the strongest Evidence for that would be Matthew 16, 28. Truly, I tell you, some of you will not taste death before you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. He said that to his disciples. They all died. So what would, you, what would your, I guess, to, to ask you the question, what would your idea be on that, uh, I guess, your counter argument to the opinion that Jesus and Paul thought that the end times were coming very soon. Okay, well, the, the verse you're talking about or the section you're talking about is Matthew 16. That's when uh, Jesus is with his disciples at Caesarea Philippi, and uh, Jesus asks Peter, uh, who am I? And Peter says, uh, you are the son of the blessed one. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. And upon this rock, Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. And he's using a play on words there because Peter's name means rock. And there were rocks there at Caesarea Philippi where the goddess Pan was worshipped and all this. Anyway, there's a lot going on in that passage. And he says, some of you won't taste death until you see the son of man coming in his kingdom. Well, Matthew 17, 1, right after that is the transfiguration. And right next to uh, Caesarea Philippi, because I've been there many times, is Mount Hermon, which is probably where the transfiguration took place. So I think Jesus at that point is referring to his transfiguration, that they would see that. So they didn't die. There's a more problematic passage, though, and that's in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus says... Um, the sun will be darkened, the stars will fall from the sky, the moon will not give its light, you know, and all this. Yep. And uh, it seems like he's predicting the end of the world there. The problem for people who say he's only predicting the end of the world is that he's actually quoting from Isaiah 13. And Isaiah 13 is describing a judgment on Babylon using the same type of language. Now, this is known as apocalyptic literature or ap apocalyptic language. It's exaggerated language about the physical universe and how it's going to basically disintegrate, even though it's not literal. And so in Isaiah 13, when Babylon was taken out, the stars did not fall from the sky, the sun did not fail to give its light or stop giving its light, etc. It was just an exaggerated way of saying it would be a calamity on them. When Jesus is saying that in Matthew chapter 24, what he's saying is there's going to be a calamity. The Son of Man is going to come on the clouds with great power and is going to judge this generation. He says before this generation passes away, all these things would occur. He said that in about 30 A.D. or 33 A.D. A generation is 40 years. It happened in 70 A.D. Because he came as a judge, and in the Old Testament, Yahweh would ride a cloud in judgment. So when Jesus says the Son of Man will come in judgment, riding on the clouds, that meant he was coming in judgment. And in that case, it was the Roman army coming in judgment on Jerusalem and on the city. And that state did not exist, exist again until 1948. So the judgment did come. Now, he's actually talking about a two-tiered uh, two prophecy. One is a short-term prophecy. That's going to happen in that generation. 
And he's also talking about the end of the world to a certain extent. Because in the parallel passage over in Luke, when he's talking about the Olivet Discourse, it's not called that in Luke, but it's the same kind of thing. He says, if you're in Jerusalem, flee to the mountains. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if it's really the end of the world, does it make any sense to flee to the mountains? No, they're gonna, that's going to be gone too. So he's talking about a short-term judgment, but it also illustrates a longer judgment. So Jesus is not a false prophet there. He's using prophecy the way uh, that the Bible uses prophecy frequently, a short-term fulfillment and then a long-term fulfillment. All right. Thank All you. Right. All right. Appreciate Thank you, it. Caleb. Good question. Yes, sir. Hi, What's your I'm, name? I'm Braden. And, Braden, um, go ahead. You mentioned earlier that you agree with the Big Bang, and I was wondering if you could give more clarity on that because I'm not sure if you meant you agree with the spontaneous creation that the Big Bang kind of um, like shows, or you just mean like textbook Big Bang, like what we learned in science class. Okay, yeah. Let's draw a distinction between the evidence for the Big Bang and the Big Bang theory. I don't believe in the Big Bang theory but I believe in the evidence for the Big Bang. The Big Bang theory is, yeah, the universe came into existence out of nothing. We don't know what caused it. Okay. I'm saying that's true. That's what the evidence seems to show. But I think the cause of it is a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent creator. Because I think that's what you get from the data. If space, time, and matter had a beginning, that's the kind of cause you need to bring it into existence. So I'm not saying that every theory... In fact, you probably may have heard of the James Webb Space Telescope, right? And for a while, someone tried to say the James Webb Space Telescope has disproven the Big, Get Big Bang. Nonsense. The James Webb Space Telescope actually affirmed the Big Bang. It showed that the red shift in the light, which is showing us that the galaxies are moving away from us, is even more shifted than we thought. The galaxies are actually expanding away from us faster than we thought. Uh, what it has caused some cosmologists to say is, wow, our, our theory of galaxy formation seems to be wrong due to the James Webb Space Telescope, but that has nothing to do with the initial creation point. With whatever their theory is of galaxy formation, that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about that there was a beginning, and the evidence seems to show that, and it seems to be congruent with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, good question. Right, Thanks, thank Jordan. You. All right, yes, sir. Hello. So one of the YouTube channel, ministry channels I watch, does a lot of apologetics, uh -huh. and they advocate and use what they call the presuppositional apologetic approach. Yeah. Would you be able to define that and say when that would be good to use? Well, it depends on what they mean by that. Um, there are presuppositions we all bring to, the, uh, to anything we do, whether it's the Bible or anything else. You know, we bring the laws of logic with us, we bring our minds, we bring the fact that we can use our senses to discover what's outside of our skulls. Those are all presuppositions, laws of logic, laws of mathematics. So if they mean that, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. If they mean, as some so-called Christian apologist, presuppositionalist people mean that you have to assume the Bible is true in order to show Christianity is true, I'm like, that's circular. Why would, what? no, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and I think the way to show that that's not the way forward, we could look at the scriptures and talk about how Jesus is an evidentialist. Let me give you one example of this. Uh, John the Baptist is in prison because he's going after Herod. Herod, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have taken your brother's wife or whatever he did, right? And he, so he's thrown into prison and then John begins to have doubts and he sends an emissary to Jesus and he says, look, uh, go ask Jesus if he's really the Messiah or should we wait for somebody else? And so the emissary goes and says to Jesus, are you, are you really the Messiah? Should we wait for somebody else? You remember what, what Jesus says back to him? You tell John to stop asking questions and just have faith. No, he doesn't say that. What does he say? He says, look, the, the deaf hear, the blind see. The, you know, he, he starts talking about evidence. He starts talking about miracles. In other words, Jesus is an evidentialist. He's not someone that just says, go out there and have faith blindly. Use evidence. Now, if someone were to say to me, okay, um, you got to use, you got to assume the Bible's true in order to prove the Bible because, uh, and, and I don't understand presuppositionalism all that well. I don't study it. So if I get any of this wrong, they can correct me. But that's how I understand it. You have to assume, you, is that the way you understand it? Uh, that's one, one of the aspects. From okay, the one of the aspects. Here's my question for somebody who says that. Because they're going to say, 
uh, you got to assume God, because if you don't assume God, how, how does anything exist? How can you ration, rationally know things? And I think that if you explain that well, they're right about that. That's what my book, Stealing from God, is all about. You've got to steal aspects of reality from God in order to say he doesn't exist. Rationality is one of them, okay? But I would ask these people who say, just believe the Bible. You've you got to assume the Bible's true in order to prove it. Why don't you just assume the Quran is true? What, if, so, if a Muslim were to come up to you and say, you know, you really got to assume the Quran is true uh, in order to show Islam is true, what would a, presuppositi a presuppositionalist Christian say? I don't believe the Quran is true. Oh, no, you must. Y you'd be at a stalemate. The presuppositionalist Christian would have to say, well, here's why the Quran isn't true and here's why the Bible is. Now they're back to using the classic evidential approach, which is, which is what we're trying to use here. So it always reverts back to using evidence. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Okay, good. Thanks, because I'm struggling here. I'm tired. <laughs> I can just presuppose that. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? I'm Liberty. Hey, and Liberty. My question is, is that in the beginning of the talk, you talked about believing that God exists in all this stuff yes. and believing in. Yes. And my question is, how would someone go from believing that all that stuff is true and being able to talk about it to actually believing in it and living that out. Well, one of the things that Paul talks about in Romans 10 is that if you believe that uh, in your heart that uh, Jesus has risen from the dead and confess with your mouth, you will be saved, right? Um, so it's a decision that you make uh, when you just go from head knowledge to heart knowledge. Um, it's accepting, f first of all, repenting of your sins and accepting what Christ has done. Are you asking personally or are you? Just in general. Yeah. Well, I would just say a lot of people can know that it's true, but still not assent to it. Uh, you know, maybe Judas knew it was true and still didn't assent to it. Maybe Caiaphas knew it was true and still didn't assent to it. Um, I know of a well known atheistic scholar, I won't tell you his name because it was a private conversation, but he said, sometimes I wake up at night and I wonder if I'm going to burn in hell for what I'm doing. Goes back to what C.S. Lewis famously said. He said, when I was a, an atheist, or no, he said, when I, sometimes when I'm a Christian, I look around and I go, man, it sure doesn't seem like Christianity's true. But when I was an atheist, I had the same thoughts. Sure doesn't look like atheism's true. You know what certainly is true? Your psychology is not going to tell you what's true outside your skull. The evidence will. In fact, let me give you an illustration of this. Some people cannot get on an airplane. They're scared to death. They think they're going to die. But if you look at the evidence... There's no safer way to get anywhere than on an airplane. You should be more afraid of getting in your car than getting on an airplane. What are we doing when we have this fear of getting on an airplane, but we have no fear about getting in a car? We're allowing our psychology to overpower the evidence. And we can't let that happen when it comes to eternity. Don't allow your psychology to overpower the evidence. What you need to do is look at the evidence, see that it's true, and then pray and say, God, I think this is true. I repent of my sins, and I want to follow you. Help me. And then get with a bunch of people who can help you do that. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. All right, great question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. So are My you an atheist? No. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? Taylor. Taylor, go ahead, sir. So, I mean, obviously, as a Christian, you know, and somebody who's going to school for that, I, I believe that the New Testament is reliable. I believe we have the evidence. But what do we say to people like um, Muslims and atheists and so on and so forth that try to say that the scriptures aren't valid or that they have you know, nothing to back it up as far as weight or what have you. Okay, you have to do that on a case-by-case -case basis. So when someone makes a claim 
it's not your job to refute what they say. It's their job to support what they say. So suppose someone says, well, I can't believe the Bible because, oh, it's been changed throughout the centuries, say, for example, which is a common claim. Don't go into a dissertation as to why it isn't. Ask three questions. The first question is, what do you mean by that? What do you mean it's been changed throughout the centuries? Because a lot of people think that we got the Bible like we get the telephone game. Like if I tell Isaac something and he tells him and then he goes around the room, right? By the time it gets to, to the back of the room, it's garbled. They think that's the way we got the Bible. That's not how we got it. But anyway, that's what they think. So always ask, what do you mean by that? The second question is, how did you come to that conclusion? What evidence do you have that the Bible's been changed throughout the centuries? And see what they say. Because I guarantee you, most of the time, people don't have evidence for their position. They've just heard a slogan, and they like the slogan. And as soon as you ask them for evidence to support the slogan, they're out of intellectual justification. So you could say, what do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? And you might say, have you investigated the manuscript evidence for yourself? I guarantee you. The guy's not going to say, well, yeah, you know, just last night I was up reading a book about the Byzantine line of manuscripts, right? right? Nobody's going to say that. Now, the third question is your opportunity to provide some evidence back to the individual. So after you say, what do you mean by that? How would you come to that conclusion? You can say, have you ever considered we didn't get the Bible like the telephone game? The way we got the New Testament documents were eyewitnesses or people that knew eyewitnesses wrote this stuff down. And then those documents were later copied, and we can reconstruct the original by comparing the different copies, and we can reconstruct the original to more than 99% accuracy. So we know what the original said. And even atheists like Bart Ehrman, who uh, is a skeptic, as you know about this, and he's a manuscript expert, he admits that the essential doctrines of Christianity are preserved in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. So just ask questions. What do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? Have you ever considered? Those questions, by the way, are in our app, the Cross-Examined app. They're also in the book by Greg Kokel you ought to get called Tactics. Do you have that book? Yes. That's a great I, book. I just ordered it the other day. Okay, good, because you can't be saved unless you read it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you know. Look, I don't make the rules, okay? Two books you have to read other than the Bible. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist in Tactics, okay? <laughs> I'm just letting you know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hey, by the way, one other thing before you go. These three questions are valuable for anything, not just Christianity. Uh, parents, you can use this on your kids, right? Like, for example, you get a phone call from your teenage son one night. who says, Dad, I'm not going to be home by 11 like you wanted me to. Don't panic. First question, what do you mean by that? Second question, how did you come to that conclusion? <laughs> Third question, have you ever considered if you're not home by 11, you're grounded for two weeks? Be right home, Dad, right? <laughs> By the way, husbands, 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 never ever use these words on your wives, <laughs> right? Because if she calls you an idiot, don't say, what do you mean by that? Or how'd you come to that conclusion? In my case, my wife's going to have a list 38 years long. All right. Make sense? All right. Thank you. Thanks for the shirt. Yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, I'm Raja. My name is Raja. Raja. Um, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask, uh, because you mentioned that Jesus had uh, brothers, I want to ask about uh, Mary's uh, perpetual virginity yes. because um, I think uh, early Christians all believed that she was a perpetual virgin even up to Martin Luther and um, the term brother in Eastern language is uh, the same as cousin uh, especially at that time I, I, I think so I want to know your opinion well that's the Roman Catholic view that Jesus Jesus's brothers were all half or weren't half brothers they were cousins you know it says brothers in there but they were cousins because mary never had another baby um i'm not a catholic i was brought up in the roman catholic church because i'm from new jersey and it's the law uh but uh, no i'm a protestant and i don't think uh while mary is blessed obviously i don't think the kind of of um, veneration that roman catholics give mary is borne out by the scriptures. In fact, they think she was sinless, some of them do. When in fact, if you read Luke chapter one, Mary is actually, it's one or two, Mary is actually calling Jesus her savior. Well, if she's sinless, she doesn't need a savior. So she must have been a sinner just like everybody else. So I don't personally buy into the idea that Mary was sinless or that Mary didn't have other children. I think that's kind of, kind of been built up around Mary. 
early and it really, I think, came into existence in the second century, not so much the first. Mm. All right. There is a really good book that you might want to avail yourselves of if you're interested in the difference between what Roman Catholics believe and evangelicals believe. It was written by my co-author, Dr. Norman Geiser, and another gentleman. It's called Roman Catholics and Evangelicals Agreements and Differences. It's a very fair book. In fact, it was endorsed by both Roman Catholics and evangelicals. And it goes through where these two groups agree and where they disagree and why. So that might be a book to get. Yeah. It's 29 years old, but it's still the best book out there. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much for the question. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my, hey. my name's Meredith. Hey, Meredith. Um, so I was wondering, um, you know how we talked about like the apocalyptic exaggerations yeah. that there are in the Bible? Um, how do we decipher what other verses are exaggerations or like metaphors that Jesus is using to teach rather than like taking them at face value because that, yeah so he used parables to teach a lot mm -hmm. um and then also when he talks about communion and eating with the disciples at the table and he says this is my body yeah this is my blood do we take that literally like is this his body and roman his catholics blood? would say yes some lutherans would say yes some orthodox would say yes most protestants would say no so that's a point of contention i don't personally think he's saying that it's his physical body because he's holding when he's doing that he's holding the bread in his hands right so his body was holding is he going to say he's his body's holding his body uh, i don't I, it just doesn't seem um it doesn't seem the right view to me could it be of course it could be maybe i'm wrong maybe transubstantiation is right um it's not something i'm going to divide over but I, I, I don't think he was speaking about it literally then. Um, also, your first question is the best question, and that is how do you discover what kind of literature you're looking at? And that's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. In fact, in, we have a course, an online course called How to Interpret Your Bible. I'll give you the spine of the course here in one minute. It's based on an acronym, STOP, S-T-O-P. Whenever you come to a passage in Scripture, you have to stop and figure out what's going on. S stands for what's the situation. What's going on historically in this period when this is being written at this time? Why, who's he writing to? Why is he writing? This is why if you do this, you're, you're not going to say it's uh, Jeremiah 29.11 is you know, for you as a promise. Okay? T stands for what type of literature. That's what you're saying. There's so many different types of literature in the Bible. There's law, there's prophecy, there's apocalyptic literature, there's parable, there's history, there's you know, uh, epistles, there's revelation, there's prophecy, there's all this stuff. And as a student, you've got to figure out what's being said, when, and how. You're going to, you're going to interpret poetry different than you do law, right? Yeah. Okay. There's, 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 there's different interpreting principles, so you have to know what those are. The O stands for who's the object of the passage. Is it ancient Israel? Is it just the exiles? Is it the New Testament church? Is it everyone? Is it just the disciples? You've got to figure out that out by the context. And the last, the P in stop stands for, is this passage prescriptive or descriptive? Like, for example, people go, well, there's so much polygamy in the Bible, God must have approved it. No, he doesn't approve of it. He says in Deuteronomy 17, 17, don't multiply wives. But a lot of them did multiply wives. That's a description, not a prescription. So you've got to figure out what is descriptive and what is prescriptive. So we'd have to look at each section on a case-by-case -case basis. That's why it's a lifelong study, the Bible, to try and figure out. Now, the best software that you can get on this is called Logos. Do you guys know about Logos Bible software? That's a great, if, it's going to cost you several hundred bucks, but it's a, lifetime, it's a lifetime investment to understand and look at commentaries and Bible dictionaries and maps and all sorts of stuff in one place. Or there's one for free online called Blue Letter Bible. Do you guys know about this? Okay, so you could go there, and if you're, if you're, if you're stuck on a passage there, Meredith, and you go, now, how do I take this? Is this supposed to be literal? Is it not? You know, maybe go read some conservative commentaries at Blue Letter Bible. It might help you for people that are scholars in this can give you some insight. Does that make sense? Yes, thank All you. Right. Excellent question. Thank Thanks you. for asking that, because a lot of people treat the Bible like it's some sort of fortune book. I'm just going to open it, put my finger, this is what God wants me to do. It says, put on the new man. I'm getting a new boyfriend this week. No. <laughs> That's not what it's about. Go ahead. Hi, yes. my name's Liam. Uh, Liam, go ahead. So I had two questions kind of maybe going correlating with each other, but I know we touched upon, like, 
Uh, some people didn't believe in Jesus when they saw, or they didn't choose to believe in him, mm -hmm. uh, like what he what he done. Um, so I guess, why didn't everyone believe in Jesus during his lifetime? And then also, what are your viewpoints on a Calvinist versus Arminianism viewpoint? I don't think we're predestined to talk about that tonight. <laughs> I just did, I'll give you the short, a short answer and then a recommendation on the Calvinism question, okay? For me, um, I'm not predestined to believe in Calvinism, I can tell you that. <laughs> because I think it makes God the author of evil and it takes away human responsibility. And I don't think it's what the scriptures teach. I think what people confuse is that because God knows all things, he's causing all things. That's false. I know tomorrow the sun's going to come up in the east. Does that mean I'm causing it to come up in the east? No, okay? Knowledge does not necessarily imply causation. When God elected to create this universe, he knew how it would turn out. But he didn't elect us against our free will. He elected us in accord with our free will, as 1 Peter 1 says. So we do have free will. God just knows how we're going to use our free will. All right, so we are chosen but free. My co-author, Dr. Norman Geiser, wrote a book called Chosen But Free. If God does all the choosing and we don't have free will, that means God causes us to sin and God is the author of evil and then God is trying to hold us responsible for doing something we had no choice in what to do that doesn't appear to be right or fair does it so no I don't think Calvinism hard five-point Calvinism is true now I just did a podcast with Leighton Flowers who is the uh, he works for the uh, the Baptists in Texas and he also has a YouTube channel called Soteriology 101 and he spends a lot of time talking about Calvinism but if you go to our YouTube, I mean, sorry, our uh, podcast, our app, and look back maybe a month and a half ago, look for Leighton Flowers uh, and myself. I'm interviewing Leighton. He's really good at this topic, and that'll help you in that area, okay? The first question had to do with, what was my favorite color? Blue. Okay, good. Now, what was the first question? It was, it was uh, why were certain people, like, Obviously, Jesus did some like miracles, and uh -huh. um, why did some people obviously believe in it, and why did some others choose not to believe in it? For the same reason we make choices now. Our choices are not always governed by our intellect. We also have emotion, and we also have will. And if you notice, even today, you can, you can speak obvious things to people, and they won't accept it, Right? I know, that now this is going to be controversial, and I'm going to say there are men and women. But everybody knows there are men and women. And by the way, transgenderism presupposes there are men and women. Why? Because if I'm a man and I think I'm a woman, I have to have some idea what a man is and some idea what a woman is to know I have this mismatch between my psychology and my biology. Also, if I'm going to make the so-called transition, I have to know what a man is and what a woman is to try and make the transition. If there were no fixed genders, transgenderism would be impossible. Also, a man and a woman, or I should say it this way, human beings can only produce one of two things. You can either produce a sperm or an egg. There's no third category. Someone who can't produce either would be an incapacity, not a third capacity. So this is true throughout the mammalian world. There are just males and females. And yet there are people today denying this. That's a mental delusion. That has nothing to do with the facts. The facts are the facts. This is why, by the way, Matt Walsh, as you know, um, has flummoxed some academics by simply going up to them with a camera and a microphone and saying, what is a woman? They can't define it because if they try and define a woman, their whole, I whole ideology gets blown out of the water. So, tragically, we're trying to coax people down a road to nowhere. You can't change your sex. I'm sorry, you can't do it. You can't change all hundred of your, tr you can't change all hundred trillion of your cells from male to female or vice versa. You can't do it. It's impossible. So tragically, our culture is suppressing the truth about what's obvious. And by the way, in parallel instances, if you had a child, say your, your daughter thought she was a mermaid, would you drive her off the coast and dump her in the ocean? No, of course you wouldn't. If she was anorexic and thought she was overweight, but she's dangerously thin, would you get her liposuction? No, of course you wouldn't. You would say, honey, 
We need to help you. I'm not going to help you by telling you what you want to hear. I'm going to help you by telling you what you need to hear. We need to get nutrition in you. We need to fix this. So there's a lot of reasons why people don't accept the obvious. And it's not always the intellect. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Time for one more. Okay. Sorry, this gentleman, because we got to be out of here by 10. Sorry. Yes, sir. Go ahead. What's your Hi, name? My name is Robert. Robert. Go ahead, sir. And, and I have um, one of Norman Geisler's books. I think it was, it's called uh, How I Know the, How, Where We Got the Bible From. Yes. Yes. And in there he uses CE and BCE as opposed to AD and BC. So what is your position on that and why? You're talking about the common era and before Be the common era. Yes. Okay. I'm just going to tell you the truth. I think it's stupid. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Before Christ and Ado Domini, is that yes. the way you say it? Mm -hmm. The year of our Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, the academics are trying to be real, like, um, academic by using CE and BCE. But why is it the common era? Because of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's why. So why not just call it what it is? Doesn't mean you have to bow down and worship Jesus. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't see any utility in that. Why did he do it? I don't know. Maybe his publisher wanted him to do it for some reason. Okay. Maybe he wanted it to be academically respectable, mm. right? Maybe it wasn't written to just Christians. I mean, it, in the long run, it's not that big a deal, but I just, I'm frustrated by it. I go, you're just being PC. As opposed to BC. Yeah, it's BC. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> thank exactly. you. Exactly. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Hey, folks, thanks so much for being here. There are some books out there. I'll go out to the book table for a few minutes if you have any other questions. But we kind of have to be out of this room uh, by 10. I think the building closes. So unless you want to be locked in until tomorrow, you probably feel like you have been here since yesterday anyway. So, uh, But thanks so much. Thanks, folks. <laughs>